Senate will come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Senators Bridges, Buckner, Coleman, Cook, Corum, Danielson. Good morning. Donovan, Fields, Gardner. Excused. Janal, Gonzalez, Gonzalez, Hansen, Henriksen, Heisey, Holbert, Jaquez Lewis, Kirkmeyer, Kolker, Lee, Liston, Lundin, Moreno, Pedersen, Pedersen. Pedersen. Priola. Rankin, Rodriguez, Scott, Simpson, Smallwood, Sonnenberg, Story, Here. Winter, Woodward, Zenzinger, Mr. President. Here. The morning roll call is 34 present, zero absent, one excused. We do have a quorum. Will the good senator from Loveland please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Colleagues, please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Approval of the journal. Senator Zenzinger. Senator Zenzinger. I move that the Senate Journal of Tuesday, May 3rd of 2022 be approved as corrected by the Secretary. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it and the motion is adopted. Senate Services. May 4th, 2022, correctly engrossed Senate Bill 172, 179, 224, and 238. Correctly re engrossed Senate Bill 40, 69, 70, 80, 85, 134, 151, 161, 186, 187, 206, 207, 210, 225, 226, 233, 30, 235, and 236. Correctly revised House Bill 1052, 1091, 1120, 1146, 1260, 1284, 1310, 1320, 1382, 1398, and 1403. Correctly re revised House Bill 1243, 1285, and 1317. Correctly enrolled Senate Bill 97, 104, 166, 168, 176, and 214. Committee reports. May 3rd, 2022, the Committee on Judiciary, after consideration on the merits, the Committee recommends the following House Bill 1376 be amended as follows and as so amended be referred to the Committee on Finance with favorable recommendation. House Bill 1383 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. House Bill 1131 be referred to the Committee on Appropriations. House Bill 1353 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation with the recommendation to be placed on the consent calendar. House Bill 1240 be referred favorably to the Committee on Appropriations. May 3, 2022, tr the Committee on Transportation and Energy, after consideration on the merits, the Committee recommends the following. House Bill 1348 be amended as follows and as so amended be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. 
May 3, 2022, the Committee on State Veterans and Military Affairs, after consideration on the merits of the committee, recommends the following. House Bill 1387 be referred to the Committee of the Whole of Favorable Recommendation. House Bill 1393 be referred favorably to the Committee on Appropriations. And House Bill 1397 be referred favorably to the Committee on Appropriations. Majority Leader Moreno. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move to lay over the special orders calendar to follow the third reading of bills calendar. The motion is to lay over the special order second reading of bills calendar to follow the third reading of bills calendar. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. Minority Leader Holbert. Thank you, Mr. President. A bit out of order uh, at this point, but having spoken to the majority leader and to myself, I request to be excused today between noon and two. Minority leader will be recorded as excused uh, from noon to two today. Third reading of bills, consent calendar. Will the clerk please read the titles to all of the bills on the consent calendar? House Bill 1403, Representative Judah, Senator Buckner, concerning a three-month delay in the implementation of health care billing requirements for indigent patients established in House Bill 21-1198. Senate Bill 172, Senators Winter and Rankin, Representatives Roberts and Rich, concerning an in initiative to increase the number of health care professionals practicing in Colorado rural areas and in connection therewith making an appropriation. House Bill 1052, Representatives McLaughlin and McKean, Senators Priol and Moreno, concerning promoting behavioral health crisis services to school-aged students and in connection therewith making an appropriation. House Bill 1091, Representative Soper and Wiseman, Senators Gardner and Bridges, concerning the online availability of opinions issued by Colorado courts and in connection therewith making an appropriation. House Bill 1120, Representative Van Winkle and Neville, Senators Woodward and Bridges, concerning the re recreation of the school security disbursement program to provide funding for local education providers to implement school security improvements to prevent incidents of school violence. House Bill 1146, Representatives Larson and McCluskey, Senators Lundin and Kirkmeyer, concerning the investment of money in the public school fund. House Bill 1260, Representative Froelich, Senator Simpson and Fields, concerning ensuring students have reasonable access to medically necessary services in schools. House Bill 1284, Representatives Esgar and Catlin, Senators Gardner and Patterson, concerning updates to state surprise billing laws to facilitate the implementation of surprise billing protections and in connection therewith aligning state law federal No Surprises Act and making an appropriation. House Bill 1310, Representatives Larson and Kemp, Senators Bridges and Woodward, concerning the alignment of the state income tax deduction for contributions to a 529 account with the changes in federal setting up every community for retirement enhancement act of 2019 that allows tax free distributions for eligible branches or programs. House Bill 1320, Representatives Kip and Larson, Senators Enzinger and Woodward, concerning the Achieving a Better Life Experience, Able Savings Program for Individuals with Disabilities, and in connection therewith, modifying who may create and control an ABLE program account, preventing the state from filing certain claims against an ABLE program account upon the death of the designated beneficiary and allowing contributions to an ABLE program account that are withdrawn for qualified disability expenses to be deducted from a taxpayer's federal taxable income for purposes of determining the taxpayer's state taxable income and making an appropriation. House Bill 1382, Representative McCluskey and Catlin, Senator Donovan, concerning the designation and promotion of dark sky locations in Colorado. House Bill 1398, Representatives Byrd and Holtorf, Senators Colker and Liston, concerning the designation of registered agents by insurance companies for the purpose of receiving service of process and in connection therewith, requiring the Commissioner of Insurance to maintain a list of such registered agents and describing circumstances when service of process may be made on the Commissioner rather than an insurance company's registered agent. Majority Leader Moreno. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move for the passage of all the bills listed on the third reading consent calendar, which includes House Bill 14. 03, Senate Bill 172, House Bill 1052, House Bill 1091, House Bill 1120, House Bill 1146, House Bill 1260, House Bill 1284, House Bill 1310, House Bill 1320, House Bill 1382, and House Bill 1398. Is there any discussion on any of the bills? Seeing none, the motion is the passage of all the bills on the third reading of bills consent calendar. Are there any no votes? Minority Leader Holbert. Thank you, Mr. President. With all due respect to the good senators from Westminster and Carbondale, I ask to be recorded as a no vote on Senate Bill 172. Minority Leader will be recorded as a no vote on 172. Senator Lundeen. Good morning, Mr. President. I request to be recorded as a no vote on Senate Bill 172 and House Bill 1382. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Lundeen will be recorded as a no vote on 172 and House Bill 1382. Senator Smallwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. I request to be recorded as a no vote on Senate Bill 172 and House Bill 1382. Senator Smallwood will be recorded as a no vote 
on Senate Bill 172 and House Bill 1382. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I wish to be recorded as a no vote on House Bill 1052 and House Bill 1390, uh, excuse me, uh, I, take, I take that back, uh, 1382. Senator Liston will be recorded as a no vote on House Bills 1052 and 1382. Senator Cook. Thank you, Mr. President. I request to be a no vote on House Bill 1382. Senator Cook will be recorded as a no vote on House Bill 1382. With a vote of 34 ayes, zero noes, zero absent, and one excuse, House Bill 1403 is passed. Co-sponsors. With a vote of 31 ayes, 3 noes, 0 absent, 1 excuse, Senate Bill 172 is passed. Co-sponsors, Senators Colker, Hendrickson, Fields, Majority Leader Moreno, Sonnenberg, Corum, Jaquez-Lewis, Bridges, Rodriguez, Janal, Simpson, Donovan, Story, Heisey. Please add the president. With a vote of 33 ayes, one no, zero absent, one excused, House Bill 1052 is passed. Co-sponsors, Senators Colker, Henriksen, Rodriguez, Donovan, Gonzalez, Janal, Lee, Hansen, Pedersen, Jaquez Lewis, Woodward, Smallwood, Bridges, Buckner, Zenzinger, Story. Sonnenberg. Please have the president. With a vote of 34 ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excused, House Bill 1091 is passed. Co-sponsors, Senators, Minority Leader Holbert, Majority Leader Moreno, Hansen, Lee, Pedersen, Liston, Smallwood, Priola, Rankin, Lundin, Gonzalez, Story, Donovan, Fields, Buckner, Winter, Rodriguez, Woodward. Please add the president. With a vote of 34 ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excused, House Bill 1120 is passed. Co-sponsors, Senators Colker, Winter, Lee, Hansen, Rodriguez, Janal, Pedersen, Minority Leader Holbert, Zenzinger, Cook, Liston, Simpson, Heisey, Kirkmeyer, Sonnenberg, Scott, Corum, Rankin, Priola, Smallwood, Lundin, Story. Please have the president. With a vote of 34 ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excuse, House Bill 1146 is passed. Co-sponsors, Senators, Minority Leader Holbert, Cook, Bridges, Simpson, Sonnenberg, Corum, Scott, Woodward, Priola, Smallwood, Janal, Colker, Pedersen, Buckner. With a vote of 34 ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excuse, House Bill 1260 is passed. Co-sponsors, 
Senators Gonzalez, Winter, Lee, Janal, Minority Leader Holbert, Rodriguez, Buckner, Donovan, Pedersen, Kolker, Majority Leader Moreno, Danielson, Liston, Fields, Sonnenberg, Corum, Rankin, Priola, Scott, Please have the president. With a vote of 34 ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excuse, House Bill 1284 is passed. Co-sponsors, Senators Hansen, Henriksen, Rodriguez, Janal, Winter, Lee, Donovan, Kolker, Gonzalez, Majority Leader Moreno, Bridges, Buckner, Story, Minority Leader Holbert, Lundin, Hawkes Lewis, Heise, Sonnenberg, Corum, Rankin, Priola, Smallwood, Woodward. Please have the President. And Senator Zenzinger. With a vote of 34 ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excuse, House Bill 1310 is passed. Co-sponsors, Senators, Majority Leader Moreno, Minority Leader Holbert, Zenzinger, Janal, Lee, Hansen, Kirkmeyer, Scott, Smallwood, Pedersen, Heise, Riola, Quorum, with a vote of 34 ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excused, House Bill 1320 is passed. Co-sponsors, Senators, Majority Leader Moreno, Janal, Buckner, Lee, Winter, Kolker, Bridges, Kirkmeyer, Akez Lewis, Smallwood, Heise, Priola, Pedersen, Story. With a vote of 30 ayes, four noes, zero absent, one excuse, House Bill 1382 is passed. Co-sponsors, Senators Gonzalez, Bridges, Story, Majority Leader Moreno, Hansen, Rodriguez, Pedersen, Jaquez Lewis, Viola, Rankin, Janal, Danielson, Lee, Please add the president. With a vote of 34 ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excuse, House Bill 1398 is passed. Co-sponsors. Senators Smallwood. Kirkmeyer. Woodward. Quorum. Third reading of bills, final passage. Will the clerk please read the title to House Bill 1218. Priola. <laughs> 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 House Bill 1218, Representative Valdez A, Senators Winter and Priola concerning resource efficiency related to constructing a building for occupancy. Senator Winter. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move for the passage of 
1218 on third reading and ask for permission for a third reading amendment. Senator Winter, can you explain the need for an amendment? Um, in earlier iterations of this piece of statute, it called out specific organizations that had to be consulted with, but now there's more organizations and we don't think it's appropriate to specifically put one organization in statute and we asked for a third reading amendment. Question before the body is Senator Winter's request for permission to offer a third reading amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it and permission is granted. Will the clerk please read amendment L17. Amendment L17 by Senator Winter. Winter. Thank you. I move Amendment L17. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, the motion is for the adoption of L17 to House Bill 1218. Are there any no votes? With a vote of... Thirty-four ayes, zero noes, zero absent, one excused. Amendment L-17 is passed. To the bill, Senator Winter. I unfortunately have to ask for an additional third reading amendment. This is outrageous. This shall not be Please explain um, yourself. <laughs> this one is a specific request from BOMA and those that own commercial properties and is reasonable and important and I ask for permission. <laughs> Senator Priola. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, this is a good amendment because it allows counties to waive, uh, which they do in other development situations, and not, not all um, situations of Vermont will be a one-size-fits-all. So it's a good amendment. Question before the body is permission to offer a third reading amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and permission is granted. Will the clerk please read amendment? Amendment L016 by Senator Winter, amend revised bill page 14 before line one, insert Senator section Winter. three in Colorado. Thank you, Mr. President. I move L016. Is there any discussion? This allows commercial properties to get waivers during um, renovations. Do not have to abide by these, which is important. The motion is for the adoption of L16 to House Bill 1218. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 34 ayes, 0 no, 0 absent, 1 excused, L16 is adopted. Senator Priola. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move House Bill 1218 on third reading and final passage. Motion is the passage of House Bill 1218. Are there any no votes? Senators Sonnenberg, Minority Leader Holbert, Lundin, Cook. Heisey, Liston, Scott, Kirkmeyer, Corum, Woodward, Rankin, Smallwood, Simpson, Henriksen. With a vote of 20 ayes, 14 noes, 0 absent, 1 excused, House Bill 1218 is passed. Co sponsors, Senators, Majority Leader Moreno, Jaquez Lewis, Pedersen, Hansen, Story. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 224. Senate Bill 224, Senators Fenberg and Gardner, Representative Tipper and Soper, concerning the creation of the Donor Conceived Persons and Families of Donor Conceived Persons Protection Act. Uh, President Fenberg. Thank you, Madam President. I move Senate Bill 224 on third reading and final passage. Is there any further discussion? Minority Leader Holbert. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Mr. President. 
in the absence of the good senator from El Paso County, who is a prime co-sponsor on the bill, uh, I just wanted to say thank you to him as well. And also thank you to the majority leader and the senator from Greenwood Village. This touches upon a topic that became more of an interest to me this year, different bill, committee, but the technology that is available to help people who want kids, who can't have them, and then the rights of those people, especially regarding privacy, have become a fascinating discussion, debate. Maybe not so much debate, because I think this one might pass unanimously. And that's fascinating. Thank you, Mr. President and the good Senator from El Paso County for Senate Bill 224. One of the more interesting bills and interesting votes that I will cast in 12 years in my last week. Thank you, Madam President. Further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the passage of Senate Bill 224. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 34 ayes, zero noes, zero absent, and one excuse, Senate Bill 224 is passed. Co-sponsors on Senate Bill 224, Minority Leader Holbert, Majority Leader Moreno, Senators Liston, Sonnenberg, Hawkes Lewis, Janal, Buckner, Pedersen, Gonzalez, Lee, Fields, Heinrichsen, Rodriguez, Hansen, Kulker, Bridges, Danielson, Story. Please add me. <laughs> Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 2? No, pardon me, correction. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 179? Senate Bill 179, Senators Janal and Liston, Representative Lantine, concerning measures to address tampering with the motor vehicle's emission control system. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move Senate Bill 179 on third reading and final passage. As for an I vote. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, the motion is for the passage of Senate Bill 179. Are there any no votes? Senators Sonnenberg, Smallwood, Lundin, Rankin. With a vote of 30 ayes, four noes, zero absent, one excused, Senate Bill 179 is passed. Co-sponsors, Senators, Minority Leader Holbert, Henriksen, Hansen, Zenzinger, Gonzalez, Majority Leader Moreno, Pedersen, Story, Danielson, Scott, Hakez Lewis, Triola, Donovan, Buckner, Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 238? Wrong word in the wrong place. Senate Bill 238, <clears throat> Senators Hansen and Rankin, Representatives Wiseman and Neville, concerning reductions in real property taxation for only the 2023 and 2024 property tax years, and in connection therewith, reducing the assessment rates for certain classes of non-residential property and all residential property, and the amount of actual value to which the rate is applied for all residential real property and commercial property for 2023, reducing the assessment rates for all multifamily residential real property use set amount for 2024, tw reducing the assessment rates for all residential real property other than multifamily residential real property for 2024 by an amount determined by the property tax administrator to cumulatively with the other provisions of the bill reduce statewide property tax revenue for 2023 and 2024 by a specified amount reducing the assessment rates for all real and personal property that is classified as agricultural or renewable energy reduction property for 2024 and requiring the state to reimburse local governments excluding di school districts in 2024 for 2023 reductions in the property tax revenue resulting from the bill. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move Senate Bill 238 on third reading and final passage. And Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I ask for the body's permission to offer a third reading amendment. Senator Hansen, would you wish to explain the need? <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, and just as a preview, I believe there are three that are going to be offered. Only one of them is mine, though, and it was because of uh, a transposition of one word, which was treasurer and assessor, 
and the drafter brought this to me this morning, uh, realizing that he needed to make uh, the switch between those two words uh, on page nine, line four. Uh, we had the wrong word in the wrong place. We need to strike treasurers and put in assessors, and I humbly ask for your permission to make that correction. Question before the body is Senator Hansen's request for permission to offer a third reading amendment. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and permission is granted. Will the clerk please read the please read amendment L006 to Senate Bill 238. Amendment L006 by Senator Hansen, amendment gross bill page nine lines. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move L006 to Senate Bill 238. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, the motion is for the adoption of L006 to Senate Bill 238. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 34 ayes, zero noes, zero absent, one excused, L006 is adopted. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for permission for a third reading amendment that is substantial in nature. That seems like a pretty good explanation. The question before the body is. I, I don't know. I've never done before. Was I supposed to ask for No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, I think we all saw it coming because it was on our desks. Yes, it was. Thank you. It, it <laughs> was put on your desk last night. The question before the body is Senator Kirkmeyer's request for permission to offer a third reading amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and permission is granted. Will the clerk please read amendment? I have to move it, right? L3. Amendment L003. Thank you, Mr. President. I move um, amendment L003. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, <clears throat> we talked a little bit about this yesterday, and I, first of all, I want to thank the sponsors for um, working with me and allowing the opportunity for this to come forward and for all of you to allowing that as well. Uh, the issue yesterday was is kind of the inherent unfairness if you are a local government taxing entity in a county with over 300,000 in population, but you may be in a local government taxing entity that has a low assessed valuation, in which case, the way the bill is set up right now is, is that if you're in a population of over 300,000, um, even though you would be in a low wealth, low assessed value taxing entity, um, you would only get backfilled at 65%. Um, but if you're in other counties um, under 300,000 in population, you could get backfilled either at 90% or even up to 100%. So what this amendment does is for those municipalities, fire districts, library district, sanitation district, and water districts that are in a county that has um, over 300,000 in population, instead of being backfilled at 65%, it would be consistent with those municipalities, fire districts, water districts, sanitation district, and library districts in um, counties that are less than 300,000 in that if you, your Assessed values for property taxation grew by 10%. You would be reimbursed or you would be backfilled at 90%. And if they grew by less than 10%, you would be um, backfilled at 100%. So I urge an I vote on the amendment. Further discussion, Senator Rankin. Uh, this is considered a friendly amendment and a valuable amendment. It uh, fills a, a need that I have been quite concerned about, particularly in some of our far-flung rural parts of the state where we may have, a, for example, a small fire district whose uh, tax bases could be quite different from, certainly from the state as a whole on average, but also from the county in which it exists. So uh, I, I urge a yes vote on the amendment. Further discussion? Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I also an urge an I vote on L003. I think uh, we had a great discussion yesterday. I appreciate the quick work uh, by the good senator uh, from Weld County and, and uh, the staff to really pull this together in a, in a uh, quick way, but in a, in a very uh, methodical, thoughtful way. Um, I think I just want to point out uh, this does change if we accept this amendment, this does change the amount of the Tabor surplus that will be used for backfill 
in the, uh, out of the 2023 Tabor surplus, moving it from approximately 200 up to approximately 227, I believe, uh, 200, around 225. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure everyone's aware of that and the implications uh, on the, the, uh, the Tabor limit and our Tabor situation for the 23 tax year. Uh, and with that, I urge an I vote on L3. Further discussion? The motion is for the adoption of Peacemaker Kirk Myers Amendment L03 to Senate Bill 238. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 34 ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excuse, Senate Bill, or sorry, L003 is adopted. Senator Kirk Meyer. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I wish to request a third reading amendment. This is a very technical in nature amendment just to add in words like the and fire in front of district, changes witches to that, a witch to a that. Um, there's some other grammatical errors. We had to do this very quickly yesterday. We had to have the substantial amendment on your desk by five o'clock. The drafter, thank God he was there at two o'clock talking with us because he wasn't able to get out of committee till like quarter to five. So we were in a rush. We didn't have the opportunity to review it again. So again, it's just technical, making sure that we have the um, fixing some drafting errors and they're technical and grammatical in nature. Uh, the question before the body is Senator Kirkmeyer's request for permission to offer another third reading amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have and permission is granted. Will the clerk please read Amendment L7? Amendment L007. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, I um, move L007. This is just a technical cleanup and a grammatical error and would appreciate an aye vote. Thank Further you. discussion. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. And uh, I urge an aye vote on L7. Uh, mm -hmm. Having reviewed the changes, uh, I think it, it essentially just cleans up uh, the amendment that we just just passed, so please say yes to L7. The mo further discussion, the motion is for the adoption of Amendment L7 to Senate Bill 238. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 34 ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excused, L7 is adopted. Senator Lundeen. Thank you, Mr. President. I request permission to offer a third, re offer a third reading amendment. Senator Lundin, will you please explain the need? For I'm looking at this amendment. It sure looks technical in nature. <laughs> yeah. Terrific. The question before the body is Senator Lundin's request for permission to offer what appears to be, but may not be, a technical amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no? Whew. The ayes have it and permission is granted. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Will, will the clerk I move Amendment L004. Will the clerk please read Amendment 4? Amendment L004 Senator by Lundin. Senator... Thank you, Mr. President. I move L004. Uh, Mr. President, upon further examination, although appearing technical in nature, this is fairly substantial. This amendment, um, although it is many ins and outs and backs and forths and doesn't really say anything specific, what it would do is, is it would have the effect of making sure that that $200 million we were talking about just a few minutes ago that became 230 or 229 million that is money that would go to the taxpayers as part of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights refund, that that money would in fact come from the general fund. Now you say, but what, wait, 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 the long bill has been closed. The money's been spent. We can't possibly do that. But as recently as yesterday, it was the will of this body in committee to add $58 million back into the the funds we have. Clearly, we have the ability to make these changes at these late dates and these last moments. Um, when the paid family and parental leave relief bill that was going to provide some paycheck relief to the taxpayers was killed in committee, $58 million flowed back into the coffers. So I simply argue that we could, if we chose, come up with this money to give back to the taxpayers direct, directly and then also provide the relief that would come through the counties indirectly, but that would be funded through general fund money. That is the effect, colleagues, of Amendment L004, and I urge your support 
of support for the taxpayers directly into their pocketbooks. Further discussion? Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I would love to ask the sponsor, the good senator from Monument, which of the schools in El Paso County should we close to pay for this amendment? Senator Lundin. We wouldn't close any of them. I would never deign to rise to that sort of bait. It would, uh, would, would not be any of the schools, as you recall. I'm the guy who ran the bill that said pay off the budget stabilization factor in full. Senator Hanson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, just to be clear with everyone in the room, uh, there is no pathway to paying off the budget stabilization factor if we accept this amendment. Let's just be crystal, crystal clear about that. Uh, we all share that goal. We made a major stride forward this year. If we accept L4, uh, there is no pathway to that goal. So please reject L004. The motion is for the adoption of L004 to Senate Bill 238. Are there any no votes? Senators Donovan, Bridges, Coleman, Jaquez Lewis, Hansen, Rankin, Majority Leader Moreno, Fields, Henriksen, Rodriguez, Kolker, Gonzalez, Henriksen, Janal, Pedersen, Buckner, Zenzinger, Winter, Lee, Danielson, Story. Please add the president. With a vote of 14 ayes, 20 noes, zero absent, one excused, Amendment L4 fails. Senator Lundin. Mr. President, thank you. Um, I request permission to, in continuation of the conversation we had and an extension of the implied agreements in the well on second readings as we move quickly, that we would have the opportunity to engage on possible future amending on thirds, request permission. How many dependent clauses were in that sentence? Question. It wasn't a sentence, it was a question. Um, I request permission for a third reading amendment. The question before the body is Senator Lundin's additional request for permission to offer a third reading amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no? no? No. The ayes have it and permission is granted. Will the clerk please read amendment L05? Amendment L005. Senator Lundin. Senator Lundin. Thank you, Mr. President. I move L005. To the amendment. This does not look at all technical. It looks substantive in nature. It actually is peripheral, peripheral to the bill itself, but fundamental. It's an underlying piece. It's an amendment that says, let's look more broadly at how we choose to tax ourselves. The amendment isn't quite exactly as I would have crafted it, but we're moving quickly. Um, the idea is we need to consider the three big categories of taxation, tax on wealth or, or property, tax on wealth as a form of income, and tax on wealth as a form of uh, sales tax. We should consider more carefully those elements. This amendment simply prods an existing commission that is looking into these sorts of things to look more broadly at uh, that array of different taxes as we try and find a tax policy for Colorado that in fact generates greater economic activity and reduces some of the frictions and drags we have on the, co the economy currently as a form of the taxation we have chosen. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And to continue the discussion on L5, I'm going to very respectfully ask for a no vote on L5 because uh, as a member of the Legislative Oversight Committee concerning tax policy, I want to assure you that uh, we are already doing this. Uh, this was a very big part of our discussion this year, in particular, the property tax related to short-term rentals, uh, which in our discussion, we were able to really uh, hone in on that as well as refer that issue over to the advisory committee uh, of tax policy experts. There's 21 members, uh, including uh, the chair, Henry Sobinet, who I'm, I'm guessing everyone in the room knows, uh, who ably led that group in giving us feedback on things uh, concerning property tax, concerning sales and income taxes. So I, I don't disagree with this sentiment, 
um, but I don't think L5 is necessary because the Legislative Oversight Committee already has this well within our scope of the, uh, from the existing legislation, and so I'd ask for a no vote on L5. Senator Rankin. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I would just like to assure ourselves that the charter of that, of that committee, of which my uh, co-prime is a member, will actually address the issues in this amendment because we need to avoid this discussion every year. This is not a discussion that ought to, and I said this earlier, that ought to occur in this chamber. Property taxes ought to be a local issue. I mean, that's where they should be managed. That's where they have effect. And I just, uh, you know, I'd like some assurance that that committee really will take up this issue uh, in the interim because I understand the spirit of this amendment exactly. It's, it's to take up the long-term issue of taxation, uh, in, which affects property taxes, sales taxes, and income taxes. So I, I hope that we can look forward to this committee and its advisory committee to really address this broader issue. The motion is for the, uh, Senator Kirkmeyer. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of this amendment as well. Um, <clears throat> yesterday, there was a lot of discussion, well, not a lot, there was some discussion with regard to this bill. Um, wasn't a lot of discussion prior to the bill being introduced. So there's a lot of confusion, quite frankly, and a lot of questions that should have been answered prior to this bill being even introduced. And I think this legislative oversight committee would have been the place to do it, and apparently they did not. Because I have questions with regard to um, how are we refunding money using our Tabor refund, and it, and it goes kind of like this. First of all, the state is exceeding their revenue limit. And so we have a Tabor refund. And we have to refund that revenue. The state does not collect property taxes as a source of revenue. We have income tax and sales tax. So they have no property tax to refund. We are, in effect in this bill, reducing local government's property tax and not refunding the payers of state taxes. Rather, we are backfilling government taxes. The backfill to the local governments is essentially an expenditure of the state, not a refund. So it has a, there's a question here, because then the Constitution, the basic question is, how does the state refund excess revenue that they don't even collect? For example, how are we refunding the state property tax revenue to local governments that we are not collecting. How is that even allowed under Tabor to do that? Tabor requires that we refund excess revenues, our excess revenues, back to the taxpayers who paid it in. Yet we're treating it essentially almost like an expenditure. So I think this committee would be vitally important so that they can help work through those questions and work through what we're actually doing with regard to refunds, Tabor refunds from a state level, and essentially trying to address a property tax issue that should be addressed and is addressed typically at the local government taxing entity. Since 1993, Local governments have been voting on property tax increases. They have been voting on mill levy increases. They have had their will. They have had their say. And they, I believe they know what they're doing. And if they don't, that's up to the local government. If local governments feel, for example, if fire districts feel they need to increase services, which would require an increase in the mill levy, they can go back and ask for a vote increase, a mill levy increase, and go to the voters. So there's that concept. When we're sitting here as legislators, essentially reducing property tax revenues for local governments, and we haven't even taken into consideration 
those local governments who have a Tabor exemption. They went to their voters and they said they get to keep all their additional revenues. We aren't addressing from this bill, we aren't addressing the impacts of that to our local governments. The other thing that's in this bill, if you look at it and where we backfill school districts, it's very specific. If you look at the um, fiscal note, that the total mills that are being backfilled for school districts, and it's in Appendix B of the fiscal note, states right at the top that it admits the override mills. So for those counties, those local government taxing entities that are in counties that are less than 3,000 in population, but in those counties, the assessed value grew by more than 10%. If you are a school district that has a mill levy override, you will only be backfilled at 90%, if I'm reading this bill correctly. So there is no discussion on how bonded indebtedness for those school districts who have a mill levy override, who now will not be receiving their growth to be able to pay back, pay off their bonds. There's no discussion how this bill's impacting it. We did not have any discussion about that. If you are a school district in a county that is over 300,000 300, in population, of which there are nine, so it's Larimer, Weld, Jefferson, Adams, Arapaho, El Paso, Denver, Boulder, Douglas, I think I named them all. They're all right here on the front range. It is not Mesa and it is not Pueblo County. Those are typically our large counties that we talk about, but they're not, they're not included in this. But if you are a school district that is in one of those nine counties with a mill levy override, so 10 mills, 15 mills, whatever it is, might be associated to operations of your school district. It might be associated in a lot of cases to bonded indebtedness, you are only going to get backfilled at 65%. Those are discussions that should have taken place with regard to this bill. Those are discussions that hopefully, if we have this amendment, it will be ensured that we start talking about how reducing the assessment ratio which reduces, especially in residential, which, which will reduce property tax revenues in all local government taxing entities, would be hopeful that those are the types of discussions that would incur at the Legislative Oversight Committee. So at least there was some discussion someplace with regard to the major tax policy that is occurring in this bill. I would urge an I vote on L005. Senator Lundin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I rise to renew my request that you support Amendment L005. I am encouraged by many of the comments we have heard from the well that this is an important matter, and I would like to reinforce that. The bill itself, 238, is an effort to get at the fact that we have an incredibly complicated system and process, and we need to make yet one more tweak in order to say, stay sustainable and survive with this one aspect, how we manage property tax at a state level, how it interacts with a local level for all the various counties, special districts, et cetera, and all the, the jurisdictions within. The, what this amendment, L005, asks is that we go back to first principles, the question of what would we, if we had the ability and I'm sure we would need to find parallel paths whereby we, on one path we continue to tweak and adjust that which we have, but to create a second parallel path that would be the path that we would design that says this is what we would create based on the fact that it is now approaching the middle of the 21st century, and we think today the way our economy and the way our lives work and the way our commerce is transacted that in fact 
there would be better methods of taxing ourselves that would create greater efficiencies and optimize those elements of our policy on behalf of the people. So amendment L005, and I've heard comments that say, yes, we're, we are getting at that, but I just want to renew the perspective that in fact it is so very important that we consider these first principles around this very, very central question of governance, and that is how do we choose to tax ourselves? Do we do it in the most beneficial and optimal way, or is it not, or is it suboptimal? And I would argue that the bill itself, 238, defines for us clearly it's suboptimal if we must continually tweak and adjust and tweak and adjust. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, colleagues. I urge your support of L005. Senator uh, Thank you very much, Mr. President. Just a quick closing comment. Uh, I mean, that, that's, that's all wonderful, solemn charge to our committee. Thank you. Uh, the good senator from El Paso County uh, that serves with me on that committee as well as the good senator from uh, Arapahoe County serves with me on that committee representing the Senate. We'd love to hear from anyone, anytime. Uh, but I, I can assure you what you're adding here is already covered in current statute. And the other thing I want to emphasize is we just heard a, a long set of remarks about how are we handling Tabor? Well, we're handling it very judiciously, colleagues. We talk about this basically every single year. The legislature is charged in the Constitution of the state of Colorado with deciding how to allocate the refunds. We have the responsibility for setting up refund mechanisms. We have done that. In fact, the senior homestead is done exactly as the first refund mechanism. What we're proposing in this bill and has just been expanded by the good senator from Weld County is to create another refund mechanism to backfill property taxes that we're reducing through the other parts of the bill. This is well-trodden ground, colleagues. We've been doing this with Senior Homestead for quite some time. It is the first Tabor refund mechanism. We are now proposing a second Tabor refund mechanism. So I urge a no vote on the amendment and a clear understanding of what we're proposing in the bill. Senator Kirkmeyer. Senator Kirkmeyer. Right. Thank you, Mr. President. Very interesting discussion that we're having here with regard to refunds and TABOR, which is exactly why this amendment should pass, so that these discussions should be taking place in the Legislative Oversight Committee, but they also should be taking place right here in this chamber. Because the nexus between why we could refund, why the state can refund based on the senior homestead exemption, at least there's a nexus because there is an obligation in the Constitution, even though we can zero it out, even though the General Assembly can zero it out, there still is at least a nexus in the Constitution between an obligation of the state of the General Assembly. So you could probably draw some nexus between why the state who collects income taxes and sales taxes could use excess revenues to refund to their taxpayers in the senior homestead exemption because of that obligation. So there at least is some nexus. But the real question is this, the state does not collect property taxes. So the basic question is, how can the state refund state revenues from income tax and sales tax? So how can the state refund their excess revenue that they do not collect, that we're trying to collect, say here, we don't collect property taxes. So how is the state refunding excess revenue from property taxes? How does that meet the constitutional requirements in Tabor? or the limitations in Tabor. How can the state refund money back to a local government? Because that's what's going on with the backfilling. That's the question that I would like answered. 
I don't know if I'll get it today, but I would like that answer at some point um, to understand. Thank you. The motion <clears throat> before the body is the adoption of L005 to Senate Bill 238. Are there any no votes? Senators Donovan, Jaquez Lewis, Major Majority Leader Moreno, Rankin, Bridges, Coleman, Hansen, Henriksen, Gonzalez, Kolker, Danielson, Story, Buckner, Pedersen, Zenzinger, Winter, Lee, Fields. Please have the president. With a vote of 15 ayes, 19 no, zero absent, one excused, L005 fails. To the bill. The motion before the body is the adoption of Senate Bill 238. Are there any no votes? Senators Sonnenberg. Garden, uh, Senator Gardner, because you, you came into the chamber during the, the debate, I was going to add you to the role after. You are excused at the moment. So go enjoy yourself. With a vote of 33 ayes, one no, zero absent, one excused, Senate Bill 238 is passed. Co-sponsors, Majority Leader Moreno, Bridges, Henriksen, Rodriguez, Kolker, Buckner, Pedersen, Winter, Lee, Fields, Story, Danielson, Jaquez Lewis. Please have the president. <clears throat> Minority Leader Holbert. Will the clerk please add Senator Gardner to the roll? Minority Leader Holbert. Thank you, Mr. President. Having voted on the prevailing side, I request or move for the immediate reconsideration of Senate Bill 224. The motion is for the reconsideration of Senate Bill 224. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no? The ayes have it. The motion is, uh, is adopted and reconsideration is granted. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 224? Senate Bill 224, Senators Fedenberg and Gardner, Representatives to Tone and Tipper concerning the creation of the Donor Conceived Persons and Families of Donor Conceived Persons Protection Act and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Gardner. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I move for the repassage of Senate Bill 224 and ask for an aye vote. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, the motion is for the passage of Senate Bill 224. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 35 ayes, zero no, zero absent, zero excuse, Senate Bill 224 is passed. Co-sponsors. Members, if you were on it last time, you don't need to get on it again. Minority Leader Holbert. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the reconsideration of Senate Bill 238. The motion is for the reconsideration of Senate Bill 238. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and reconsideration is granted. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 238. 
Senate Bill 238 by Senators Hansen and Rankin, Representatives Wiseman and Neville concerning reductions in real property taxation for only the 2020, 23 and 2024 property tax years and in connection therewith, reducing the assessment rates for certain classes of non-residential property and all residential property and the amount of actual value to which the rate is applied for all residential real property and commercial property for 2023, reducing the assessment rates for all multifamily residential real property to set amount for 2024, reducing the assessment rates for all residential real property other than multifamily residential real property for 2024 by an amount determined by the property tax administrator to cumulatively with the other provisions of the bill, reduce statewide property tax revenue for 2023 and 2024 by the specified amount, reducing the assessment rates for real and personal property that are classified as agricultural or renewable energy production property for 2024 and requiring the state to reimburse local governments excluding school districts in 2024 for 2023 reductions in their property tax revenue resulting from the bill. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm so glad we got to hear that title one more time. I move for the repassage of Senate Bill 238 on third reading and final passage. Is really? Is there really discussion? Really? Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to know what the rules were if I could get another 10 if I wanted them. Is, is that the rules? Technically. technically. Thank you. That's it. You can technically. That's, and that's why we will not allow any reconsiderations from here on out. <clears throat> the motion is the passage of Senate Bill 238. Are there any no votes? Senator Sonnenberg, Gardner. With a vote of 33 ayes, two noes, zero absent, zero excused, Senate Bill 238 is passed. Co-sponsors. Majority Leader Moreno. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Colleagues, um, the Chair of Appropriations is right here signing the committee reports as we speak. We will be reading those over shortly, and so we will take a brief recess, and uh, a special orders calendar will also be distributed. Who would like these hot numbers? Message from the House. May 4th, 2022, the House has passed on third reading and transmitted to the Reviser of Statutes, House Bills 1230, 1151, 1391, 1358, and 1026, amended as printed in House Journal on May 3rd, 2022. The House has passed on third reading and transmitted to the Reviser of Statutes, House Bill 1388 and 1064, amended as printed in House Journal May 3rd, 2022, and amended on third reading as printed in House Journal May 4th, 2022. The House has passed on third reading and transmitted to the Reviser of Statutes, Senate Bill 9, amended as printed in House Journal April 11th, 2022. Message from the Reviser. May 4, 2022, we hear with transmit without comment as amended House Bill 1026, 1064, 1151, 1230, 1358, 1388, 1391 without comment as amended Senate Bill 9. Committee reports. May 4th, 2022, Committee on Appropriations. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following Senate Bill 43 be amended as follows and as so amended be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendations and with the recommendation that it be placed on the consent calendar. May 4th, 2022, Committee on Appropriations. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following Senate Bill 237 be amended as follows and as so amended be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation and with the recommendation that be placed on the consent calendar. May 4th, 2022, the Committee on Appropriations. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following House Bill 1007 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. May 4, 2022, the Committee on Appropriations, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1053 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. May 4, 2022, Committee on Appropriations, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1217 be amended as follows and as so amended be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. May 4, 2022, Committee on Appropriations, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1251 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. May 4, 2022, Committee on Appropriations. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1269 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. May 4, 2022, Committee on Appropriations. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1314 be amended as follows and as so amended be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. May 4, 2022, Committee on Appropriations. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. 
House Bill 1350 be amended as follows and as so amended be referred to the Committee of the Whole a favorable recommendation and with a recommendation that would be placed on the consent calendar. May 4, 2022, Committee on Appropriations. After consideration on the merits, the Committee recommends the following. House Bill 1364 be amended as follows, and as so amended, be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. May 4, 2022, the Committee on Appropriations, after consideration on the merits, the Committee recommends the following. House Bill 1369 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation, with a recommendation that it be placed on the consent calendar. May 4, 2022, Committee on Appropriations, after consideration on the merits, the Committee recommends the following. House Bill 1375 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. May 4, 2022, Committee on Appropriations, after consideration on the merits the committee recommends the following house bill 1394 be amended as follows and as so amended be referred to the committee of the whole with favorable recommendation may 4 2022 committee on appropriations after consideration on the merits the committee recommends the following house bill 1400 be referred to the committee of the whole with favorable recommendation May 4, 2022, Committee on Appropriations. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1402 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. May 4, 2022, Committee on Appropriations. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1408 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. The Senate will stand in a brief recess.
that's when you found out. That's not where veteran and military bills go. That's where it all bills go. That is. Majority Leader, are you ready? What's that? Senate will come back to order. Majority Leader Moreno. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate take up House Bill 13. Oh, you read across the report. I move that the Senate take up House Bill 1372, Senate Bill 43, House Bill 1350, and House Bill 1369 on special orders consent calendar at the hour of 11. 34 a.m. The motion is that the Senate take up the bills on the special orders consent calendar at the hour of 1134 a.m. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and that motion is adopted. The Senate will take up the bills listed on the special orders consent calendar at the hour of 1134 a.m. Special order, second reading of bills, consent calendar, Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the Senate resolve itself to the committee of the whole for consideration of special order, second reading of bills, consent calendar. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. Hmm. Anybody out there? The motion is adopted and the Senate will resolve itself into the committee of the whole for the consideration of the special orders, second reading of bills, consent calendar, and Senator Coleman will take the chair. The committee will come to order and the court rule is relaxed. Would the clerk please read the title of all the bills in the special order, second reading of the bill's consent calendar. House Bill 1372, Representative Carver, Senators Gardner and Fields, concerning an exemption from air emission limits for the use of a stationary engine to support critical infrastructure in emergencies. Senate Bill 43, Senator Cook, uh, concerning enhancing restitution services for victims. House Bill 1350, Representative McCluskey and Rich, Senator Bridges and Lundeen, concerning the creation of a grant program to meet workforce needs throughout the state. House Bill 1369, Representative Sirota and Pelton, Senator Story and Sonnenberg, concerning the support for children's mental health programs and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Majority Leader Moreno. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move for the passage of all the bills on the special orders consent calendar and their associated committee reports, which includes House Bill 1372, Senate Bill 43, and the Associated Judiciary and Appropriations Committee reports, House Bill 1350, and the Associated Business, Labor, and Technology and Appropriations Committee reports, and House Bill 1369. Any discussion on the committee reports? Motion for the body is the adoption of all the committee reports on the special order, second reading of the bill's consent count. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. All the committee reports are adopted. Any discussion on any of the bills on the consent calendar? Motion for the body is the adoption of the bills on special order, second reading of the bill's consent calendar. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the bills are adopted. Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the committee rise and report. Motion for the committee to rise and report. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the committee will rise and report. The Senate will come to order. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. The committee has had a number of bills in consideration. Would a clerk please read the report? Mr. Pre Mr. President, your committee of the whole begs leave to report it has had under consideration the following attached bills being the second reading thereof and makes the following recommendations thereon. Senate Bill 43 is amended. Passed on second reading and ordered and grossed and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. House Bill 1372. House Bill 1350 is amended. House Bill 1369 passed on second reading and ordered, revised and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the report. The motion is the adoption of the committee of the whole report. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 35 ayes, 0 noes, 0 absence, 0 excuse, the Committee of the Whole Report is adopted. Senate Bill 43 is amended, passed on second reading order in gross, and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. House Bills 1372, 1350 is amended, 1369 passed on second reading order revised, and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate take up Senate Bill 234, Senate Bill 237, House Bill 1354, House Bill 1399, House Bill 1014, 
House Bill 1042, House Bill 1056, House Bill 1215, House Bill 1220, House Bill 1235, House Bill 1267, House Bill 1278, House Bill 1289, House Bill 1290, House Bill 1304, House Bill 1318, House Bill 1325, House Bill 1349, House Bill 1352, House Bill 1359, House Bill 1159, House Bill 1010, House Bill 1365, House Bill 1007, House Bill 1053, House Bill 1217, House Bill 1251, House Bill 1269, House Bill 1314, House Bill 1364, House Bill 1375, House Bill 1394, House Bill 1402, and House Bill 1408 on special orders at the hour of 11.39 a.m. The motion is that the Senate take up the bills listed on the special order second reading of the bill's calendar at the hour of 11.39 a.m. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no? The ayes have it, that motion is adopted. The Senate will take up those bills listed on the special orders calendar at the hour of 11.39 a.m. Special orders, second reading of bills, Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the Senate resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of special orders, second reading of bills. You have heard the motion, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no? The motion is adopted and the Senate will resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for the consideration of the special orders, second reading of bills, and Senator Coleman will take the chair. Committee will come to order and the Colt Rule is relaxed for everybody up in here. Would the clerk please read the title to House Bill, Senate Bill 234. Senate Bill 234, Senators Hansen and Rankin, Representatives Ortiz and Snyder concerning unemployment compensation. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I move for the passage of Senate Bill 234 on second reading. Seeing a further discussion, Senator... There's a member at the desk. Will the clerk please read L16. Amendment L01. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I move L16 to Senate Bill 30, 234. To the amendment, Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Uh, this is an amendment that we received after some, or created after some feedback from CDLE on how the forms will be created and distributed and then collected from claimants. Uh, this is really just to make sure that the department can implement this correctly on the form that they will create to gather the necessary information. Uh, so I urge the adoption of L16. Any discussion on L16? Any seeing none, the motion is the adoption of L16. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. L16 is adopted. Senator Wilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a, a couple amendments that I want to talk about today, a couple of them you've seen before. I'm going to go rather quickly so as not to delay the process too much here. Um, one, and, and then after I talk about this First Amendment, I'm going to kind of walk us through why this is, why this is a big deal and why we need to think about this uh, particular decision that we're about to take. Um, one of the things that I mentioned earlier this week that we heard about was that there was at least $73 million worth of fraud that the state paid out. And I think it's important that that not land on the backs of small business. There's a member of the desk. Would the clerk please read L14? Amendment L014. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I move L014. To the amendment, Senator Wilbert. Uh, this amendment simply takes the $73 million out of the general fund, puts it into the unemployment trust fund so that it's... Uh, and that, that number, by the way, remember, is the amount of fraud that we identified uh, had been paid out by CDLE. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I would love for the good senator to tell me which high school in El Paso County we should close uh, to pay for this transfer. In all seriousness, where would you like us to find $73 million in the general fund? Senator Wilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would be happy to, to go line by line through some of the waste that's in the budget, um, but uh, at, this, at this late hour, I think we'll, we'll leave it as is. Senator Hansen. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I welcome that debate. Uh, as co-sponsors on this bill from the Joint Budget Committee, we always love to talk uh, about ways to improve the budget, uh, but elusively, the waste, fraud, and abuse uh, canard uh, doesn't show up again, folks, so until we see it, uh, let's please not take that under consideration. 
Uh, this is an amendment that I urge you to reject. Uh, we don't have $73 million uh, reserved in the budget for this, and I want to point out that we gave $600 million from the ARPA funds, uh, which more than covers uh, the $73 million in this amendment. So I urge a no vote on L14. Seeing the further, Senator Rankin. I'll just reiterate that we actually did a pretty good job containing fraud. Seventy-three million is a lot of money, but you know the six hundred million is a, you know, philosophically assumed to absorb uh, the fraud. So, urge a no vote. Motion is the adoption of L fourteen. All in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. And those have it. L fourteen is lost. Senator Wilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One of the curious things about this particular bill as it's coming before us today is how it's opposed by small business. Uh, NFIB is one of the folks who's been, who's been pretty active in this process since day one. And, and as we walk through some of the reasons for this, um, I would, part of it comes from the fact, I think the biggest part comes from the fact that we're expanding benefits. So as part of that, I just wanted to walk the sponsor through some of the costs that they didn't look at in the fiscal notes. And, and, and I don't know if that was because it happened so quickly or, or, or what exactly happened. So one of the items that's in this is the one week eligibility of costs. Um, what I'm about to go through to the bill sponsors is that that one week eligibility is going to cost 53 to $100 million every year, year in and year out. So, and the, and the way that they came up with those calculations um, they're, they're gonna, they're, they took a look at a very conservative week. So the week of April 23rd, there were 2,500 new cases. The prior week, there was about 2,500 cases. It's conservative because April tends to have fewer new cases of uh, unemployment claims. So if we take that conservative 2,500 a week in claims over the next 52 weeks, that results in 130,000 additional initial claims that will be uh, made every year, 130,000 claims. And if you look at the U.S. Department of Labor and Statistics, the uh, quarterly, the average weekly benefit amount in the state of Colorado was 412. So what this bill does by, by that one week expansion and what the fiscal analyst didn't catch is that we're expanding the benefits at a cost to the UITF of over $53 million on the most conservative basis. Uh, the bill sponsors also told us that we know at least 10 million more a year will come out uh, because of the expansion of benefits to those who are uh, undocumented or otherwise um, unlawfully present within within the state. So, so all of a sudden we're looking at a you know we're certainly giving uh, a 600 million dollar package of relief to small business, but we're also setting them up for the long term to have somewhere between 60 and 110 million just because of the expansion benefits. So as we, as we think about this commitment, I think that that's, that's really the piece that needs to be fixed. Um, I just got this data from the Department of Labor this morning. I did not run any number or I had not had a chance to run an amendment on it. Uh, perhaps if we take this up later today, we may get into it a little bit. Um, with that, I'm going to go back to one of the amendments that we did have earlier this week just to make sure that we understand uh, what that item is going to be. Um, so I do have an amendment that I'm about to deliver. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Amendment L11? Amendment L011 by Senator, Senator Woodward. Woodward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment L011. To the amendment, Senator Wilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, uh, this gets at uh, opening up uh, a new benefit that will further drain the UITF and put uh, more uh, burden on the backs of uh, employers, job creators, and small business. Uh, strikes uh, strikes a line on page seven and replaces it with that if you are if you want to be eligible, you have to be lawfully present within the state. Senator Hans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I ask for a no vote on L11. Motion is the adoption of L11. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The no's have it. L11 is lost. Seeing a further discussion, the motion is the passage of Senate Bill 234. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. 234 is adopted. 
Would the clerk please read the title of Senate Bill 237. Senate Bill 237, Senators Fenberg and Holbert, Representatives Kennedy and Larson, concerning measures to promote increased transparency of funds used in ballot measure campaigns. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Senate Bill 237 along with the State Veterans and Military Affairs Committee report and the Appropriations Committee report. To the SVMA Committee report, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in State Affairs, we ran two amendments. Um, uh, it clarified that uh, this refers to Colorado ballot measures, statewide ballot measures. Um, we also, uh, the, the amendment also um, averaged uh, the amount of spending to be over three years rather than two years. And then lastly, um, we kicked out the implementation date for one aspect of the bill uh, until September to allow for additional time for software programming at the Secretary of State's office. Senator Lundin. Senator Lundin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question on percentage. What were the percentage thresholds? Mr. President. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, to, to the good Senator for Monument, we did not change the percentage. We just allowed it to be to apply over three years instead of two years. Motion is the adoption of the SVMA Committee Report. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. SVMA Committee Report is adopted. <laughs> Appropriations Committee Report, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Appropriations uh, Committee, um, of course, appropriated money from cash funds. Uh, we do have a small technical amendment to fix something that was in that amendment, though. The motion is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Appropriations Committee report is adopted. There is an amendment to the desk. Would the clerk please read? L4. Amendment L004, Mr. Senator President. Stanberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L4. L4, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This uh, simply uh, fixes uh, an error in the J amendment in appropriations this morning and sends the money to the correct line items uh, for the cash funds. Uh, it was sent to the wrong line items. Motion is the adoption of L4. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. L4 is adopted. To the bill, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, this is a, a bill that came out this morning on the consent calendar. Um, obviously, we needed to take it off to do that one fix. Um, this is a, a bill that I think provides more clarity for organizations, for those who participate in ballot measures uh, to, to ensure that folks know what the rules are and how things are going to be calculated so they stay within the lanes of of what is legal and, and, and also to provide uh, transparency to voters and folks who are receiving some of these communications to know where that spending and that money is coming from and urge, urge an I vote. Motion is the adoption of 237. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Senate Bill 237 is adopted. Clerk, please read the title of House Bill 1354. House Bill 1354, Representatives Lindsay and Micah Slingene, Senator Winter, concerning mental health and workers' compensation cases. Senator Winter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move for the passage of House Bill 1354. And the Business Labor Technology Committee report? And the Business Labor and Technology Committee report. To the BLT Committee report, Senator Winter. In BLT, we made sure that uh, employers had the information they need to abide by safety standards. Motion is the adoption of the BLT Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the uh, Business Labor Technology Committee report is adopted. To the bill, Senator Winter. Uh, thank you. This just ensures that um, your mental health records, when it's related to workers' comp, are not uh, given to your employers so that they are kept confidential as they should be. Motion is the adoption of 1354. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, 1354 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of the House Bill 1399? House Bill 1399, Representatives Ortiz and Basin Acre, Senator Janal, concerning consumer protection, consumer protection relating to music therapy services. Senator Janal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I move uh, House Bill 1399. There are no committee reports. To the bill, Senator Janal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, House Bill 1399 is about title protection for music therapists. Music therapists work with our most vulnerable populations. These include those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, autism, patients with Alzheimer's disease, as well as um, 
patients with um, um, Parkinson's and other uh, types of uh, sensory impairments. They work in a variety of settings. They work in schools and in general hospitals, in rehab facilities, in hospice, in behavioral health facilities, child development centers, private practice, and many, many more areas. Uh, music therapy is even billed frequently under Medicaid. And this bill represents the first step in ensuring that Coloradans have the access to safe, quality, compassionate care by ensuring that only those who are appropriately credentialed are allowed to call themselves music therapists. Music therapists have a bachelor's degree, some have master's degrees, others have uh, doctoral degrees, and uh, they have to uh, take a rigorous board examination. So they just want title protection as music therapists. and. Um, so that someone can't profess that uh, they are a music therapist unless they have been properly credentialed by the certification board for music therapists. Uh, CSU has a wonderful program for music therapists. They, uh, I have myself sat in on uh, music therapy for people with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and it is amazing what that therapy does to people with these uh, neurological issues. So um, I ask for your support on uh, House Bill 1399 and allow the uh, uh, making sure that music therapists are properly con credentialed. Motion is the adoption of 1399. Senator Lundin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate so very much the, the good senator bringing the bill. Um, as, as I read the bill and contemplated the bill, um, I engaged first kind of in a public safety um, set of filters in my mind. Um, is, does, is there a potential risk of abuse? Um, could someone, someone perhaps with uh, intellectual disabilities, something of that nature, could they find themselves in a situation where they are being abused? I was trying to determine in my mind the need for the bill because the bill creates a crime I mean, there is a deceptive trade practice, which is a crime. We're talking about creating new criminals should people run afoul of this. And so started thinking through. And the, the root question I got to and the question I would ask the sponsor is, why? What is the need? Um, I'm, I'm curious about the context. This is one of those bills I love to hear in committee because we always have anecdotal information. I had an experience. It was a less than positive experience. Therefore, you should write a law. And I'm not sure that that is adequate. The, my perspective is that when there are classes, significant numbers of individuals that are being negatively affected or, or positively affected, but there are significant numbers of people being affected, then it cries out for public policy. I'm just asking the sponsor to give us a context that says this is why, as opposed to just one or two instances where something might not have been completely optimal, why is it that, in fact, this bill is necessary? Senator Janelle. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, the, to the good senator from Monument uh, for those questions. Uh, there is, in the bill, that, as you had said, uh, there is a, a, a fine, um, and it is a, for violation of the Con Consumer Protection Act, but there is a potential for harm. Clients can become aggressive, they can become violent, um, and music therapists are trained to deal with these situations when someone who hasn't been through four or six years um, and, and taken uh, a number of uh, hours of clinical training between the practicum and the uh, supervised internship and passing a national board exam, that possibly the people who are not credentialed may not uh, know that they're, what they're dealing with in certain types of situations. So it is written into the bill that warnings will be issued first. Warnings will be issued first. So it doesn't mean that someone can't go to uh, a rehab uh, uh, facility or a hospice facility and play a guitar, uh, but in regards to certain types of clients that are actually being um, uh, that are actually being served by music therapists, uh, there is an issue uh, and training that's involved for certain types of, of these clients. 
So I ask for an I vote. Senator Lundin. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And, and to the bill sponsor, I completely understand why someone who would choose to get into this occupation, hold themselves, hold themselves out as a music therapist, wants to be properly trained, especially if there are circumstances in which a client, someone to whom you're providing service, might become aggressive. You certainly want to, to in fact, be prepared for that. But that's not really what the bill does. The bill creates a new crime that says, if you choose to hold yourself out as a music therapist, you must meet certain, certain criteria, you must do certain things. So we're creating um, a restriction, we're putting restrictions on the ability of people to provide something which may be beneficial to other human beings. And then the question, or the bill itself says, that, and we will create this concept of a deceptive trade practice, we create a crime. If you do that, then, then you will be subject to penalties. So then the question is, well, how necessary is that? And, and the, the fiscal note analysis is pretty clear on this. Legislative council staff is required to include it when you have a comparable crime analysis. It's required whenever we create a new, a new crime, which this bill does. Legislative council is required to include certain information in the fiscal note for any bill that creates a new crime, changes the classification of an existing crime, or creates a new factual basis for an existing crime. This section outlines data on crimes comparable to the offenses in the bill and discusses assumptions on future rates of criminal conviction for those offended. So this kind of goes to the heart of do we need the bill? Prior conviction and data assumptions. This is what the analysts who've looked into this situation assessed the circumstance, tried to determine whether or not there is a need for the bill. The bill creates a new factual basis for the existing offense of committing a deceptive trade practice by adding the use of the title music therapist without being credentialed appropriately as a decept deceptive trade practice. From fiscal year 1819 and fiscal year 2021, zero offenders have been sentenced and convicted for this offense. Therefore, the fiscal note assumes that there will continue to be minimal or no criminal case filings or convictions for this offense under the bill because the bill is not expected to have a tangible impact on criminal related revenue or expenditures at the state and local levels. These potential impacts are not discussed further in this fiscal note. So that's a, a jargony way, the way the folks from the fiscal department write that says probably don't see a lot of activity around this issue. So then I loop back to the bill sponsor and say, are there dozens or hundreds of cases where people are deceptively holding themselves out to the, to the detriment of society as a music therapist. Senator Janal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, basically, this is not a bill about crime. It's a bill about title protection, about consumer protection in the Consumer Protection Act. This is not the first of its kind. Uh, we have dietitians, we have opticians, we have sign language interpreters. This, they all have title protection. So all the music therapists are asking is that uh, if you claim to have this degree, then you have title protection because you went through these many years of study and internship and clinical training. And um, if you didn't go through the training and the degree program, then you shouldn't be holding yourself out there as a music therapist. So I rise in support of 1399 for title protection for music therapists. I think it's, uh, you shouldn't uh, be claiming to have a degree that you didn't earn. Seeing no further discussion, Senator Lundeen. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And, and I appreciate the Senator's uh, presentation of this bill. Um, my perspective as I land on this, as I think it through carefully, this is certainly something that is completely appropriate for a trade association to gather together and say, hey, look, we need to make sure people understand who we are, what our trade is about, who the highly credentialed individuals are and who the people that would pretend to be us but are not us. We should, as an industry, make sure people understand that. I'm not certain that this is an appropriate matter for the red books where we put black words on white pages called the Colorado Re Revised Statutes. I'll be a no on the bill, but I appreciate the Senator's efforts. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1399. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Polls no. 
The ayes have it, 1399 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1014. House Bill 1014, Representative Judah, Senator Pedersen, concerning the creation of an epilepsy awareness special license plate and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Pedersen. Thank you. I move House Bill 1014. To the bill, Senator Pedersen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L004. There's an amendment to the desk. Would the clerk please read L004? Amendment L004. Senator Pedersen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is just a technical Sen fix, and I ask for your support. And Senator Pedersen, could you please move the, move the amendment one more time? I move L004. Any discussion on L004? Any opposition? I'm not in committee. The motion is the adoption of L004. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. L004 is adopted. To the bill, Senator Pedersen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is the only license plate bill that I've ever done. It's in support of epilepsy awareness, and the money will go towards the Epilepsy Foundation, and I ask for your support. Motion is the adoption of 1014. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. 1014 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1042? House Bill 1042, Representatives Exum and Van Winkle, Senators Buckner and Heisey, concerning the ability of a teen parent to attend driving school without a cost and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Senator Heisey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1042 and the accompanying committee report. Senator Transportation and Energy Committee report. Senator Heisey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, very complicated amendment there. We uh, changed families to families, economic security. Motion is the adoption of the Transportation Energy Committee report. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Transportation Energy Committee report is adopted. To the Appropriations Committee report, Senator Heisey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, Appropriation Committee uh, found it in the best interest of the uh, good people of Colorado to uh, fund this program. Motion is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Appropriations Committee report is adopted. To the bill, Senator Buckner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am pleased to co-sponsor this bill with my dear Senator um, because this is concerning the ability of teen parents to attend driving school without having to pay. And if you had heard the testimony of these outstanding young people who are going on with their lives, but they have to have transportation to get to work or to get their babies to preschool and they do not have the funds to pay for this. I told Senator Heise that I wish I were a philanthropist and that I could provide cars for these young people as well, but maybe we can do that at some other time. But this is an outstanding bill hel helping teen parents be responsible in getting their driver's license without having to pay for it or without having to pay for driving school. So I'm asking for a I vote on this important piece of legislation. Any further discussion, Senator Heise? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as we know, the, the uh, responsibility largely falls to the mother. Uh, this bill does include uh, either parent, and as one of the young ladies uh, told me later, that the, the father of her baby uh, was the one responsible and took the responsibility to get her to and from school so she could graduate. Urge and I vote. Motion is the adoption of 1042. All in favor say aye. Aye. Polls no. The ayes have it, 1042 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1056? House Bill 1056, Representatives Michael Sinjane, Senator Moreno, and Gonzalez Gutierrez, and Senator Moreno, concerning emergency temporary care for children and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1056 on second reading. Motion is the adoption of 1056. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, 1056 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1215? House Bill 1215, Representatives McCluskey and Bacon, Senator Bridges, concerning expanding opportunities for high school students to enroll in post-secondary courses and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 215 on second reading. The motion is the adoption of House Bill 1215. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it on 1215 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1220. House Bill 1220, Representatives Kip and McLaughlin, Senators Zenzinger and Corum, concerning removing barriers in educator, educator preparation to support educator candidates entering the educator workforce and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1220 and the Education Report and the Appropriations Report. There is no Appropriations Report on my page, but Education Committee Report, Senator Zenzinger. 
Uh, we made a couple of adjustments in uh, committee in order to limit the number of people who can participate in the portfolio process. Motion is the adoption of the Education Committee Report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. The Education Committee Report is adopted. To the bill, Senator Zinzinger. Good bill. Vote yes. Senator Quorum. Better bill. Vote yes. <laughs> the motion is the adoption of 1220. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. 1220 is adopted. The clerk, please read the title of House Bill 1235. House Bill 1235, Representatives McCormick and Catlin, Senator Janal, concerning the continuation of the regulation of veterinary practice by the State Board of Veterinary Medicine and in connection therewith, implementing the recommendations of the 2021 Sunset Report on the Colorado Veterinary Practice Act by the Department of Regulatory Agencies, adding registration requirements for veterinary technicians, adding veterinary technicians to the State Board of Veterinary Medicine, allowing certain unlicensed individuals to administer rabies vaccinations and making an appropriation. Senator Janal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is the continuation of the Veterinary Practice Act and it provides oversight for veterinarians and veterinary technicians for the next 11 years, sunsetting in 2033. Senator Sonnenberg. And I move House Bill 1235 and ask for an I vote. Senator Sonnenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And although I love my veterinarians, this process needs changed, and this sunset did not change that process. This process that we have now gave us Ellen Kessler, gave us radicals, quite frankly, that have no business serving on a vet board. This whole process, not only for this sunset, for a number of these appointments, need changed. And it needs changed so we take the activists out of this process and allow people that actually have skin in the game or understand this process to be a part of it. This sunset continues the same appointments, the same board members. I would argue that we should reject this and quite frankly, if I remember correctly, it doesn't sunset until 23. I may, not, I may not have that right. And bring it back next year with some proper thought and consideration. Do not follow the, regu uh, the recommendations uh, from the state and come up with our own process. Ask for a no vote. Motion is the adoption of 1235. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. 1235 is adopted. The clerk, please read the title of House Bill 1267. House Bill 1267, Representatives Valdez A. and Basinacre, Senators Janal and Fields, concerning culturally relevant training available to health care professionals and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Janal, when she comes back to the well for House Bill 1267. Madam President, pro Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that we lay over House Bill 1267, one bill. Motion is to lay over House Bill 1267, one bill, for one bill. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it in 1267. We laid over one bill. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1278? House Bill 1278, Representatives Young and Pelton, Senators Lee and Simpson, concerning the creation of the Behavioral Health Administration and in connection therewith, making and reducing an appropriation. Senator Lee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1278, the Appropriations and Health and Human Service Committee reports. To the Health and Human Service Committee reports. Senator Lee. The Health and Human Services Committee had an extensive hearing. They made 10 amendments on the bill, all of which um, were passed and accepted to make the bill better, clarifying responsibilities, um, resolving conflicts, and making some technical corrections. Move for adoption of the HHS report. Motion is the adoption of the HHS report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it in the Health and Human Services Committee report is adopted. To the Appropriations Committee report, Senator Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the Appropriations report did have a sponsor amendment uh, to eliminate the authorization of the Opioid and Other Substance Use Disorder Study Committee to allow it to, to wait one more year before they engaged in that and also did the traditional appropriation of the appropriate amount of appropriate money to support the BHA. The motion is the adoption of appropriation report. All those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The appropriate committee report is adopted. To the bill, Senator Lee. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. The Behavioral Health Administration bill implements the recommendation from a year ago to create a behavioral health administration in Colorado to provide um, uniform care, consistent care, available care for um, behavioral health, substance abuse disorders statewide so that people in all areas of the state have access to behavioral health. It uh, sets up a crisis system and enables participation by uh, populations throughout the state to, again, to access care. Senator Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the Behavioral Health Administration, House Bill 1278, is, uh, follows um, suit as my, the good senator from El Paso County referenced years of work. It's a culmination of years of engagement and planning from stakeholders, behavioral health experts, and the legislature. It really started in September of 2020 with the Behavioral Health Task Force report, which detailed recommendations about, how, about the need and the necessity for improving behavioral health care in Colorado. Um, it, it was the result of um, last year's House Bill 21197, which allowed us to go down this path for the creation required the department to create a plan for the BHA and the plan based on those recommendations. And that, that bill passed the Senate unanimously 33 to zero and the House 52 to eight. I was gonna take just a moment and talk about some of the uh, discontinuity, I guess, in the current behavioral health space. Um, LSS provided some uh, guidance last summer as part of the Behavioral Health Task Force I'm going to outline existing programs in the behavioral health space and the substance use disorder space across a variety of departments. So in the Department of Corrections, there's a drug and alcohol treatment program. There's a mental health program. Inside the Department of Education, there's Project AWARE, which is a multifaceted initiative to improve school climate, safety, and substance abuse prevention. There's the behavioral health care professional man matching grant program. There's a mental health education resource bank and technical assistance. Under HICPUF, behavioral health capitation programs. <laughs> the most Sorry. I'm still going, I'm still going, I'm still going. Behavioral health fee for service payments, screening, Brief intervention, brief intervention and referral to treatment grant programs, very brief. Utilization management for inpatient SUD, substance use disorder treatment. Audits for denials for inpatient SUD treatment. Screening for perennial mood and anxiety disorder. Care coordination, managed care organization service, mod service modifications and training. Then on, the Department of Higher Education has Senator Simpson. Mr. Chair, I move House Bill 1278. Motion is the adoption of 1278. All those favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. 1278 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1267? Well done. Well done. House Bill 1267, Representatives Valdez A. and Basinacre, Senators Janelle and Fields, concerning culturally relevant training available to healthcare professionals and in a connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Janelle. Um, Senator Janelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1267 and the Health and Human Services Report and the Appropriations Report. To the Health and Human Services Committee Report, Senator Janelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the HHS committee added EMS providers to the list of health care providers and built in a pathway towards accreditation for training uh, purposes to incentivize pr providers to participate in programs that are offered. And the appropriation, whoops, I, sorry, I asked for an I vote on the uh, committee report. The motion is the adoption of the Health and Human Service Committee report. All those favor say aye. Polls no. The ayes have it, and the HHS committee report is adopted. To the appropriate committee report, Senator Janelle. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. The appropriations report decreased the amount of appropriations from one million to nine thousand dollars. Motion is the adoption of the appropriations report. All in favor, say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Appropriations report is adopted. To the bill, Senator Janal. We have some. No, he come after. No, we're to the bill, sir. To the bill. Senator Fields. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Members, House Bill 1267 is a very important bill. The reason why it's important because it addresses diversity and making sure that we have culturally relevant health care providers to support those that are dealing with behavioral health, mental health, physical health, or what have you. And as a state, we're seeing that our state is growing as it relates to diversity. We have a very rich uh, state with all kinds of cultures that are blending together. And basically, this bill makes sure that we have health care professionals that can provide training to people who are different. And so when you're trying to address your own needs and someone looks at you like you're different and you're out of place, we need to make sure that professionals can connect with people and meet them at the place that they are. That means that we need providers to be open and receptive to put their biases somewhere else when they're having a face-to-face -face discussion and conversation about the issue that someone is bringing to them. So if you are a black woman, an Asian woman, and the list goes on and on and on, then you need to be able to meet them where they are. And what culturally relevant training will do will help you suspend your judgments and your biases and listen to the issue that is being presented to you. Whether you like that person's look or their sexual orientation or their economic status, this bill provides training for you to suspend any bias or stigma that you might have about somebody because they look different than you. Seeing no further discussion, Senator Small, Senator Janal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to add in the LGBTQ plus community as well. Thank you. I ask for an I vote. Have you seen my amendment? You're good with it. Senator Smallwood. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, colleagues. So, um, really interesting um, discussion about uh, this bill. And there are several pieces in here where I um, really support the bill. Um, so, I just want to read one portion here because I do have an amendment that I'd ask the body to, um, to accept. And I believe the bill sponsors will find this to be a friendly amendment. We had a conversation in committee about the definition of prior, uh, priority populations. So, in a nutshell, I think the um, conclusion that we've come to is that um, as physicians are getting their training, whether that's in med school or subsequent, subsequent training, um, uh, they're, they're taught about medicine, right? How to, how to take care of people, um, but not necessarily uh, take care of people um, who might be um, a, a little, um, well, disproportionately affected, let's say, right? So we're talking about um, older Americans. We're talking about children and families. We're talking about our veterans. We're talking about people with intellectual disabilities. We're talking about folks um, regardless of their uh, gender identity and sexual orientation. So because, um, again, not everybody is the same, um, making sure that there are resources there to um, have those providers trained in a broader spectrum, I think is a good thing. Um, so one question that I had in committee and that I've been speaking with the bill sponsors about is um, one term, which I believe is becoming antiquated, which is people of color, um, and wanted to know if we might want to hone in on that term and perhaps 
uh, modernize it. Um, secondly is um, specifying um, people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning. And as you know, in that category, that's a definition that we see um, expanding um, almost every year, certainly every few years. So with that, I would introduce Amendment 11. There's an amendment of the desk. Would the clerk please read L11? Senator Smallwood. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Um, what you'll see in Amendment 11 is we are changing the word uh, on, line, on page 2, line 12. We're changing people of color and instead inserting black people, comma, indigenous people, and then moving on to people of color. So using a more modern definition, which I've spoken with the bill sponsors about. Um, Please move L11. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment 11. To the amendment. Senator Smallwood. Great. I've already spoken about lines 1 and 2 of Amendment 11. Um, second is I, I expressed concern in committee about the LGBTQ definition being uh, quite constrained and, in my opinion, probably also being um, not very inclusive, uh, even by today's definition. So what I had proposed instead was that we... Uh, replace that with, uh, or excuse me, including um, people of disproportionately affected sexual orientations and gender identities, which allows for potentially future expansion, and people who have AIDS or HIV. So that's not striking anything. This is going to be an, in addition to. And then um, striking the word disabilities on page three, line two, and adding in other populations as deemed appropriate by the Office of Behavioral Health. So again, in an effort to be more inclusive and uh, modernizing the language and allowing uh, future changes that I think um, everybody would agree with, I would ask for your I vote on Amendment 11 and would love to hear from the bill sponsors if they agree with me. Senator Janelle. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the good senator from Douglas County. We, uh, as bill sponsors, uh, we have talked to uh, the good senator from Douglas County about this amendment, and I consider it a friendly amendment. It is making m more inclusions into this bill, which we need, um, and especially for LGBTQ, but also for um, other folks who are disproportionately affected. Uh, so. I, I, I ask for your I vote on L011. It is a friendly amendment. Motion is the adoption of L011. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. L011 is adopted. To the bill, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I rise in opposition to this bill. And I get it, and I appreciate some of the changes that have been made. Um, especially with the definition regarding priority populations, because originally it just said means priority populations identified by the Office of Behavioral Health in its 2020 Behavioral Health Needs Assessment, which nobody really knew what that was. So they uh, did change the definition, and we just changed it again. Starts including all sorts of other folks, as mentioned, but it also includes older adults, children and families, people with disabilities, including people who are deaf and hard of hearing, people who are blind and deaf, deaf blind, people with brain injuries, people with intellectual and developmentally disabled disabilities, and people with other co-occurring disabilities. So that, that was a good change. I agree with that part. Here's, here's why I rise in opposition to the bill, though. And we heard that this is an important bill. And I'm sure it is for some people, but I think a more important bill would have been to actually address the um, types of priorities that are out there for additional opportunities for professional development that these healthcare and human services professionals are actually saying they need. So <clears throat> where this bill directs the Office of Behavioral Health and the Department of Human Services to create a culturally relevant and affirming healthcare training grant program to provide funding to nonprofit organizations and we had an amendment on that one too 
and statewide associations of healthcare providers now to develop new culturally responsive training programs to benefit priority populations, which again, I just read to you, we've got a new definition for priority populations. But in 2020, a survey conducted by Relias, I think is how you say it, R-E-L-I-A-S, who is a provider of healthcare training and professional development services of 5,000, so a survey conducted of 5,000 healthcare and human services professionals found that infection control, mental health, and trauma-informed care ranked among their highest priorities for additional opportunities for professional development. So they didn't say culturally relevant and affirming healthcare training was the need that they have. These 5,000 healthcare and human services professionals, so it wasn't like it was just a random or just 100 people or something. 5,000 healthcare and human services professionals found that infection control, mental health, and trauma-informed care is where they say are their highest priorities and need for additional opportunities for professional development. Healthcare is a very complex and ever-evolving field, and opportunities to acquire new skills and knowledge are likely even in greater demand in the aftermath of COVID-19 after the pandemic. This bill is proposing to train providers in culturally relevant and affirming healthcare, but train providers in that instead of what they really need and what they said they needed, which again was infection control, mental health, and trauma-informed care. That makes a lot more sense. So I don't understand why we're not bringing a bill forward that does that, especially if we're going to spend a million dollars of our general fund revenues. I mean, surely there's a better use for that million dollars. Oh, wait, in fact, there is. The good senator from Denver kept asking us, where do we get the money for some of the questions and things that were proposed this morning related to unemployment or related to backfill? So, well, here's the first million. Here's where we can get the first million dollars, right here. This is the bill that can start us down the pathway of finding the money we need for other important programs or important programs that we actually have within the state, that we actually have an obligation to fund, that actually meets what are some of our highest priorities. So I'm a no vote on this bill because again, we're creating a training grant program for a million dollars to define and develop new programs for culturally relevant and affirming healthcare training when what the healthcare and human services professionals are asking for is infection control, mental health, and trauma-informed training as their highest priority. I ask for a no vote. Senator Lundin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I believe that uh, the super able um, Assignables clerks are grabbing me a copy of the amendment that just got on. Um, I, it's a, I wanted to speak to that uh, simply because it feeds into the broader question I have, which, and here it is. Thank you, Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Um, it, it's an amendment that was accepted by the, the uh, sponsors as a friendly amendment. And, and what it sought to do is to keep the language contemporary. Um, and I think that's important. And, and to make sure that we were identifying individuals. So it, it struck, um, actually it could, black people, indigenous people were added into the language questioning it, it inserted people of disproportionately affected sexual orientations, gender identity. These people have AIDS or HIV, um, disabilities, and other populations deemed appropriate by the Office of Behavioral Health. And, and I think that makes sense because when we start proscribing in the law all sorts of things. We need to keep the, the law fresh as culture evolves, as, as our perspectives um, begin to change, and as we seek to, 
to make sure we are truly being authentic and sensitive and, and decent with our fellow human beings. And that prompts me to come to a fundamental question. And quite frankly, I am struggling a little bit, and I think I was trying to figure out why I was struggling. And, and it's this idea of creating priority populations. And to me, that just seems to be antithetical to who we've always claimed we are as a people, as Americans. This idea that we, we are all equal. We have this egalitarian is the word we use, society. We, we all, no matter who we are or how we present or where we come from, we always want everyone to have an equal opportunity. We call it a meritocracy. We, we don't do things um, be, beyond, um, or we don't classify people uh, you know, in a caste role. You, know, you come from the, 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 the Indian culture where the Brahmin caste is the highest caste of individuals in that society, and then the, the lowest people are the untouchables, that, uh, and there are any number of castes in between, and, the, and that's an, become antiquated even in that culture, but there are still elements of that that, that exists. In, a, in America, from the beginning, from the founding of our country, we've always said egalitarian. But this bill specifically creates a definition. And the definition is priority populations. It means people experiencing homelessness, people involved with the criminal justice system. And then it goes on to make this long list of individuals. So then the question becomes, well, OK, now that we've defined priority populations, what is that about? What do we do? And here's the meat of the, the bill. On or before January 2023, the office shall create a culturally relevant and affirming health care training grant program to provide money to nonprofit entities and statewide associations of health care providers to develop new culturally responsive training programs to, and here's the, the piece of the question, this is where my question comes from, to benefit priority populations. I'm slightly uncomfortable with that. I wish that we could say all of these people, we care about them desperately. We care about them that they should all be equal and have the same access and the same opportunity and the same care and decency and engagement that we should treat every human being, quite frankly, and every American in the, in the ethos of our country, egalitarianism. But this doesn't say that. It says to benefit priority population. So what does priority mean? Words mean things to us. The most basic definitional uh, source we have is we all go to, to the Merriam-Webster dictionary. Definition of priority. The quality or state of being prior. Well, that's not especially helpful. Whenever a definition refers to a root of the same word, it doesn't take you anywhere. Precedence in date or position of publication. Okay, something that comes first in timing. And then it gets to the B definition, superiority in rank, position, or privilege. And then the, the last definition is legal precedence and exercise of rights over the same subject matter. Superiority in rank, position, or privilege. I have a little discomfort, and, and I would love to hear the sponsor's feedback on this. I would prefer language, that's, because I believe in all of this. Of, of making sure that individuals who present differently have a different circumstance, have a, a different challenge, perhaps, they must never in any way be treated, treated, considered, uh, engaged with in any way that is less than we would engage with any other individual who is privileged or, or has any set of opportunities that others may not have. But the idea of creating a priority population, I think, could, has potential, the potential to, to maybe become insidious to where we start saying, oh, the priority population in America is this list of individuals that we've created. If the bill said, on or before January 21st, the office shall create a culturally affirming health care training grant program to develop new culturally responsive training programs too, and then we didn't say priority populations, but we chose a different definition and said, that we, we do this in a way to make sure we are not, in fact, disadvantaging anyone, that individuals who present diff differently are, in fact, being given every opportunity that anyone gets to, to be, in fact, treated, treated and engaged with completely equally 
in the egalitarian ethos of who we are, that would give me comfort. But I, this idea of creating people above and before others feels a little bit uncomfortable to me. It's a, and I realize I acknowledge it's a very philosophical position, but I, I would love to hear the sponsor's perspective. Senator Janal. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I think the bottom line in what you're, you're looking for is that people are not just patients, that they should be treated, for example, LG, I'm, I'm LGBTQ. And I have had issues talking with a health care provider in the past. I, I may not now, but I have in the past. It's been hard to talk to them. And some of them may not be as aware as other physicians about how to treat LGBTQ. And I think that these health care training programs to help health care providers help them understand the people that are their patients that may not fall into that common category um, and that are treated differently. So I hope that answers your question. I hope that you will, uh, you members will support uh, House Bill 1267. It is an important bill in regards to equality and how to treat people like patients. Thank you. Senator Lundeen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, absolutely on board with the making sure everyone is treated equally, that no one is treated any differently or, or, or that there isn't an understanding and therefore there needs to be training. The whole piece of what's training, it's this whole idea, it's the definitional thing of creating a priority population. I'm, I'm just tripping over the idea that we are going to say these people that are on this list are ahead of all other people. That is the challenge, that is the root challenge that I, that I struggle with. Um, to the making sure people are trained to engage with the people on this list, to make sure that they are engaged with in a way that is meaningful, that is understandable, that is accessible, that is highly beneficial. Uh, that I am completely on board with. I'm just struggling with this, this definition, this new construct of putting one group of people ahead of all other people. Motion is the adoption of 1267. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Oops. The ayes have it. 1267 is adopted. <laughs> Madam President, pro tem. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to lay over House Bill 1289 and House Bill 1290 to the end of the calendar or the end of the special order second reading calendar. The motion is to lay over House Bill 1289 and 1290 to the end of the special order second reading of the bill's calendar. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. 1289 and 1290 will be laid over to the end of the special order second reading of the bill's calendar. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1304. House Bill 1304, Representatives Roberts and Bradfield, Senators Coleman and Gonzalez, concerning state grants for investments in affordable housing at the local level and in connection therewith creating the Local Investments and Transformational Affordable Housing Grant Program and the Infrastructure and Strong Communities Grant Program to invest in infill infrastructure projects that support affordable housing and making an appropriation. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1304 and the Local Government and Appropriations and Appropriations Committee Report. For the Local Government, commi for the local government Committee Report, Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. We made uh, a um, we made a number of amendments in the Local Government Committee to uh, clarify uh, the language. I ask for an I vote. Motion is the adoption of the Local Government Committee Report. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Does having local government committee report is adopted to the appropriation committee report, Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In the appropriations committee, we appropriately appropriated the bill. Motion is the adoption of the appropriations committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Does having appropriations committee report is adopted to the bill, Senator Gonzalez. Thank you. I ask for an I vote. Senator Lundeen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. House Bill 1304. Yeah? 1304? We're moving so fast, we want to make sure it's on the right bill. The bill proposes to spend almost $178 million provided to the state through the Federal American Rescue Plan, the ARPA money. So this is part of the multiple billions we're spending um, in this session on housing and infrastructure projects. The lack of affordable housing in the state has indeed reached a crisis point. According to a study by the Common Sense Institute of Housing Development in Colorado, the state has over 175,000 fewer housing units than needed 
to restore its historical population to housing ratio and the history of that ratio is established between 1986 and 2008. So between 1986, four years after I graduated, five years after I graduated from college until just before the Great Recession, we established a ratio. X number of people, Y number of houses, that's what we found to be reasonably comfortable in Colorado, or at least it was sustainable at that point. We are 175,000 housing units short of that to get that ratio back at least to that level, which probably did have some discomfort to it. To close this deficit and account for projected population growth, the state will need to add over 54,000 housing units a year through 2026. The local investments and transformational affordable housing grant program could be a solution to the housing deficit. However, however we must ask if the preferences built into the bill for rigidly defined income thresholds will catalyze the increased level of home building necessary to do so. To build a home and sell a home is a pretty risky proposition. It takes a willingness to deploy capital, to invest capital frequently to take on debt. These projects are so big, a home for any of us is so big we just don't write the check out of the checking account to buy a house. You mortgage it, there's debt involved. It's a big proposition. And there are rigid income categories created. For the, as for the Infrastructure and Strong Communities Grant Program, it is a little bit unusual to see a proposal to invest more dollars in infrastructure development after the passage of Senate Bill 21260 and rulemaking in the Department of Transportation that could shift some $6.7 billion by 2050 away from road and highway construction necessary to support the demand for these housing units. Instead of new grant programs, perhaps we simply should use our transportation funding as it's intended to be built, used to build roads, bridges, and highways, because if you can't get to the homes, if people can't come and go, then th the construction of those homes become superfluous or not meaningful in the marketplace. Um, I rise in opposition to this bill. Senator Liston. Um, I have to ask the chair before I leave and say thank you as the chair changes. Will we be moving with alacrity, sir? As always. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, um, uh, we heard this bill in local government here a couple of weeks ago, and I appreciate the intent and the desire of the good senators from Denver and Denver. Um, uh, and uh, as I was listening to the bill, and you look at the fiscal note and the discussion on the bill, is, uh, you know, certainly uh, it's well known that Colorado has a housing problem. And it's also an affordability problem. And in, in fact, just today in the local Gazette newspaper uh, in my community, Colorado Springs, uh, real estate prices, home prices have escalated even more so. In fact, I think the figure is $60,000 more than what they were a year ago. Uh, so, you know, and that's true all up and down the front range. It's true in many parts of Colorado. And, you know, um, as I've said repeatedly, you know, I, I can appreciate the fact that we're wanting to uh, encourage people uh, uh, to uh, be able to have their housing and so forth. But, you know, uh, owning that, uh, buying the house is the easy part. A lot of times people uh, uh, can get into a house with zero down or 5% or 10% down and it sounds all good, uh, well and fine, uh, uh, we're, uh, but, but they get into the house and then through changes in family circumstances or jobs or people moving and uh, so forth, they find that they can't afford to stay in the house or they don't want to stay in the house or for many reasons. But for the group um, that has owned their homes for the last 10 and 20 and 30 years or more, it's our seniors, uh, that they bought their home uh, 20 and 30 years ago. <clears throat> They've been in their home. They paid their property taxes year by year by year. They've seen their property taxes go up. 
I hate to think what's going to happen when they get their uh, property tax uh, bills uh, next year. There's going to probably be some coronary, so uh, be a red alert for our good friends in the EMS services. But as I've stated many times before, is the good seniors that have uh, that have dutifully and willingly uh, and sa and sacrificial sacrificially have paid their property taxes year after year after year. Um, in this bill, there is no relief for them. So with that in mind, um, I would like to move uh, L014. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L014? Amendment L014 by Senator, Senator Liston. Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll please move uh, the amendment. Members, uh, so uh, in this bill, uh, it's proposed uh, that, the, that under the affordable housing and home ownership uh, uh, grant, uh, $178 million. The last I checked, that was real money. That's serious money. S so uh, I move, once again, I move L014. And what, what it does is that it uh, uh, will ask that the, uh, that the money that is awarded to the, uh, these grants that are award, awarded to the local governments under the grant program is that 10% uh, of that money must be used to help the Colorado residents that are 65 years and older and that have resided in their primary residence for the last 10 years. These are the seniors that I've talked about again and again and again who have uh, uh, worked hard, saved hard, paid their bills, paid their property taxes. Uh, they are low risk uh, 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 seniors, um, and if anybody deserves a little bit of help, it is the seniors uh, that is addressed in uh, L014. So this just asks that a, that a small portion uh, be distributed to those seniors to help them on their property tax. I urge an I vote on L014. Thank you. Senator Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, colleagues, I um, appreciate uh, the good senator and uh, this amendment that I'm just seeing uh, and reacting to. Um, to be clear, um, we recognize that um, the issues uh, impacting uh, Coloradans who are um, uh, who are being we recognize that the issues that for Coloradans who are um, facing um, difficulty in paying their property taxes, given the um, sharp rise in appreciation uh, of their homes, is a very real issue. It's why we are dedicating an entire policy um, to a, a, a totally separate bill to property tax relief. I think that that uh, this concept would be much better situated in that policy conversation uh, as opposed to this bill. Uh, this bill pertains to state grants and investments in local affordable housing, not to property tax relief. And for that reason, Madam Chair, with all respect and admiration um, to the Senator from uh, El Paso County uh, for his um, work on uh, the, um, in highlighting the issues impacting uh, older Coloradans uh, in our state, I respectfully request a title ruling. A title ruling has been requested. We will stand in a senatorial five.
Uh, the chair rules that L14 um, doesn't uh, fit under the title. We are back to the bill. Okay. Seeing no further discussion, Senator Lundin to the bill. Right? Actually, I really. No, I'll, I'll go. Thank you. Okay, so without seeing any further discussion, the motion before the body is the adoption of House Bill 1304. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no? No. Nope. The ayes have it in 1304 is passed. Will the clerk please read the title to 1318. House Bill 1318, Representative Benavides and Senator Fields concerning the extension of the Law Enforcement, Public Safety and Criminal Justice Information Sharing Grant Program deadline. Madam President Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bill lay over one bill. We move. House Bill 1318, lay over uh, one bill. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have in 1318 will lay over one bill. Would a clerk please read the title of House Bill 1325? House Bill 1325, Representatives Kennedy and Caraveo, Senator Janal, concerning alternative pay payment models for primary care services and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Senator Janal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1325 and the Health and Human Services Report, as well as the Appropriation Report. The HHS Committee Report, Senator Janal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the committee just uh, added that uh, change that providers and carriers are included in the stakeholder process and that there is confidential and proprietary information, and that remains confidential, and I ask for an aye vote. Motion is the adoption of the HHS Committee Report. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Health and Human Services Committee report is adopted. To the Appropriations Committee report, Senator Janal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I move the appro Appropriations Report, and the Appropriations is basically a technical change in the Appropriations Report to change uh, to the Department of Personnel, and I ask for an aye vote. Motion is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Appropriations Committee report is adopted. There is a member of the desk. Would the clerk please read L17? Amendment L017, Senator Janal, amend the Health and Human Services Committee. Senator Janal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L017. To the amendment, Senator Janal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What L017 does is it makes minor technical changes and wording that was requested by the Division of Insurance. It also makes uh, DOI uh, sure that they can accurately implement the bill, and it also makes sure that stakeholders ensure insurers and providers both of them have been consulted and and are in agreement with the changes i ask for your support for l017 senator lindine oh senator 05 has been requested and we'll take a senator 05.
All right, members, we are, the motion is the adoption of L17. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, L17 is adopted. Any further discussion on House Bill 1325? Senator, Senator Janelle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1325. Uh, what this does is it continues the same great payment reform work that was done about three years ago with the creation of the Colorado's Primary Care Payment Reform Collaborative. The collaborative is a group that includes providers, it includes patients and health insurance plans and is facilitated by the, Depart the Division of Insurance. They've been studying ways to improve Colorado's outdated fee-for-service payment system and improve pr primary care. And this is the next step in payment reform conversations. I ask for an I vote. Senator, Small, Senator Lundin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so 1325 requires the Division of Insurance to collaborate with the Department of Health Care Policy and Financing, the Department of Personnel, and the Primary Care Payment Reform Collaborative to develop and create rules for alternative payment model parameters for primary care in the commercial health insurance market, which will be effective um, out in 2025, January of 2025. Uh, but uh, it would be only on plans issued and renewed at that point. The division is also required to develop and periodically update a set of core behavioral health performance monitoring system, comprehensive behavioral health safety net system, regionally based uh, behavioral Health Administrative Service or Organizations and the BHA as the licensing authority for all uh, behavioral health um, uh, entities and the BHA Advisory Council to provide feedback to the BHA on the behavioral health system in the state. The bill transfers to the Department of Public Health and Environment and responsibility for community prevention and early intervention programs previously administered by the department. And that, um, for me, the most interesting aspect of the bill is exactly that last piece, the, the uh, devolution to the local um, previously state-held activities and, and efforts. Um, I, I'm, I have challenges, questions about the bill, um, but I am not as expert as perhaps others, um, so I'll just register for the record. This is a, a lukewarm no from me. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Smallwood. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and colleagues. This is, this is such an interesting topic. So um, I, I have to be honest. I really, really did not like this bill as introduced, um, which is only unfortunate because conceptually I really like it. Um, it but like what we do here so often, the devil is often in the details. And big picture, for those who are still trying to make sense of House Bill 1325, the big picture thinking was, you know, we've got this sort of antiquated model of uh, compensating providers uh, via contracts uh, for the work that they do. So um, if you take you back to 35 years ago, 40 years ago, um, you, you by and large went into a doctor's office or the hospital and if something happened to you that was covered under your health insurance policy, the doctor, the hospital would send you a bill as a patient, you would pay the bill and you would file a claim form with your insurance company. How many people remember health insurance claim forms? You'd, you know? grab a, your, your pen and you'd complete a claim form and you would mail it into the health insurance company, right? Because there weren't very many fax machines then. You'd mail it into the health insurance company and after they scrutinized it, a few weeks later, they'd send you a check back for what you were owed. Um, well, then call it 30, 35 years ago, the insurance companies got this bright idea of contracting with doctors and hospitals and laboratories and imaging facilities, and they would put together these preferred provider organizations. So by and large, health insurance companies or their affiliates would put these networks together and they would go to, hypothetically, uh, physicians and say, look, docs, if you will agree to discount what you would normally charge your patients, 
And if you would agree that the discount would be at this level, what we will do is we will add your name to these printed books, these provider directories, and we will give that, that printed book to all of those uh, enrollees who have purchased our insurance plan. And when they are looking for a physician, let's say, or a hospital, they're gonna open this printed directory like a phone book and they're gonna go through it and say, oh, Dr. X, if I go see Dr. X, then when I go to get these services rendered, I'm going to receive a discount. So it's a win-win, right? The uh, physician gets to see patients, a pay, an increase in patient load because their name is printed in this preferred provider directory and the patient wins because their portion of the, uh, the charged medical bill ostensibly would be lower, all right? And by and large, those contracts, you know, had 80% coinsurance or 90% coinsurance. So the patient was on the hook for 30, 20, 10% of that bill. So if that was a smaller bill, then the patient wins. And obviously the insurance company wins because uh, because this provider directory provides these discounts and ideally has a robust uh, network of providers that they would have more people want to sign up and purchase their insurance, right? So the, the idea was that everybody wins. Well, the unintended consequence of this over time is that um, a lot of people start to question the reality of these discounts, right? Are they, you know, they're a discount from what? You know, from what price are, are they discounted? And what we've heard from patients now for years, if not the last couple of decades, is, you know, these discounts aren't really all that they're cracked up to be because physicians, let's say, or hospitals are just artificially inflating the non-discounted number so that the discounted number is really the number that they feel it should have been all the time. And there is now this perceived disincentive of providers being perhaps encouraged to provide maybe even unnecessary work, right? So this discounted fee-for-service model has been under the microscope now for, for years, wanting to know if we are perhaps encouraging the wrong behavior from physicians or hospitals. And as a slight aside, colleagues, who would blame them? Who would blame a physician in our litigious society when faced with a binary choice of either providing too much care, maybe that extra lab test, maybe that extra scan, maybe that extra scope, maybe one more visit to the specialist, right? This is the kind of stuff that if I was a physician, I would certainly think to myself, hey, if I want to protect myself from a medical malpractice lawsuit, it's probably a good thing for me to better be safe than sorry and perhaps order these tests. And oh, by the way, I get paid extra every time I do that. So not only do I have money coming in the front door if I order that extra test, order that extra scan or scope, but I'm also protecting myself, my practice, my partners, my employer, potentially from medical malpractice lawsuits. So colleagues, what we've done is we've built this system under discounted fee for service where now the question is, is it win-win? Does anybody win under a, under a situation like this? So that's where this concept really intrigued me, is saying what a lot of insurance companies have figured out over the last few decades is maybe discounted fee-for-service isn't the right way to go, and we should be looking at these alternative payment methods. I think the best example would be uh, the only group model HMO in our state. It's been around for, what, 70 or 80 years now, where they instead said, look, we're going to only contract with one group of doctors. We might not own them, they might not actually work for us, but what we're gonna do is try to create some alignment between making sure that we're delivering good care with high patient satisfaction 
while at the same time not putting these um, misguided financial incentives in for providers where they have to worry about, should I order this extra test? Should I order this extra scan? And lo and behold, because the model worked, it wasn't too long afterwards that other insurance companies said, hey, maybe we will go to the doctors that we've contracted with and go to them to say, look, why don't we build a different way of compensating you? Something maybe focused on preventive care, for example. So if physician A, physician B can prove to, in this case, let's say the health plan, that hypothetically speaking, the patients that they see have very high levels of mammography, completion of pap tests, completion of prostate screenings, that if they can prove that, then the insurance companies will pay them because they're proving to do the right thing for their patients, keeping their patients healthy, number one, and lowering the cost of healthcare, number two, as a logical byproduct. That sounds smart. Or going to the physicians, hypothetically, and saying, um, if you will agree to be the primary care physician for this group of patients, which, let's face it, primary care, I've got a lot of people in the room that know primary care is certainly not the most compensated medical profession to get into, right? Not in a world of specializing. So if you will agree to stay in primary care and sort of shepherd this group of patients in their primary care quest, we will pay you, hypothetically speaking, a capitated amount or a per head. So money is coming into your office, into your practice, so that, again, everybody wins. The primary care physician is rewarded for agreeing to create this relationship with their patients, and the patients, as a byproduct, know who their doctor is. How many of you don't even have a doctor? The primary care, it looks like every hand has come up. Uh, well, many hands have come up. Um, so in this effort to encourage a relationship between a patient and a primary care physician so that that patient knows, things like capitation have been developed. And over time, we see more and more and more of this. Doctors are rewarded an extra amount for having high patient satisfaction. How many of you have ever switched doctors because the doctor that you went to see had lousy bedside manner? They're like, this person's not even nice. This person, in fact, is mean. I don't want to see this doctor anymore. And again, people handling the reimbursements for this know that that's a bad thing. If you can't stand your doctor, what are the odds that you're going to go back and see him? Right? So, so all of these incentives have been put into place. So now let's bring in House Bill 1325, at least as I saw the introduced version. How I read the introduced version was because we know that these alternative payment methods have worked, they really have, whether you're talking about the public sector or private sector, Medicare, Medicaid, or commercial markets. Why don't we as the government decree what is the best alternative payment model, best alternative payment method, because we in government are so much smarter than anybody in the private sector that we as the government will create this model, we will force feed it to everybody in the healthcare delivery chain, and it will be the way to do things. And I was really worried about that. A, because I don't know if you could tell with my little bit of sarcasm there, but I don't really believe that. I believe that when smart people, whether they're in the private sector or in government, come up with something innovative in the world of alternative payment models, that you know, maybe, just maybe, it is the better way of doing things. And I saw House Bill 1325 as really sort of tamping that down, as stifling that innovation, and certainly taking away the financial incentives for, let's say, for-profit or not-for-profit insurance companies to benefit from this. Because the thinking of 1325 was, if this person has a great idea on alternative payment models. We are going to take that from them and we are going to add it to this methodology matrix. And again, it's gonna be 
force-fed to everybody. So that the person that came up with that alternative payment model really saw no benefit in it. Why would they do that? Why would they do it? Why would you come up with something innovative and proprietary if you don't get to benefit at all from it? And that was my big concern about 1325, is that that might be the case. So um, if I haven't been really clear, huge fan of alternative payment models. It is the way of the future. Discounted fee for service and, in, and pure indemnification of healthcare providers, I think is an anachronism. I think it's a dinosaur. But we have to be able to combine the thinking that alternative payment models really is the way of the future while also encouraging this innovation that I think is desperately needed in this. So I want to thank the uh, bill sponsor and the house sponsors, actually, for um, being, I would say, um, extraordinarily open to this conversation. And this isn't something that you know we had to do from the well. This is a face-to-face -face conversation that we had. And again, as an aside, for those of you who are married to legislating remotely, and I understand there's good reasons to legislate remotely, sometimes you have to. If you have a surgery, for example, it's a really good reason to do it. But for those of us who wonder whether or not it's worth being in this room or not, 1325 is a great example. Because we were in this chamber, people from both houses and both sides of the aisle sitting in this chamber talking about good ideas as it relates to this bill. And candidly, colleagues, like I said when we first started deliberating uh, remote uh, legislation, that, that is my fear of this body, is that the conversation that we had might not happen three years from now or five years from now if I'm looking across an, an empty room and we need to have a conversation where we get people from the House and the Senate and both sides of the aisle together. Uh, the good work that was done on House Bill 1325, I don't think would have happened. So I want to give a huge shout out to um, the Senate sponsor, to the House sponsors of this bill for being open to conversation, listening to other ideas, not just digging in saying, look, we have all the votes, this is the way it's going to happen. Um, I think much better legislation was created here. Now, what I'm worried about is that this will somehow get um, undone, right? Because we've made changes. It's got to go back to the got to go back to the other chamber, um, where it might not be viewed as uh, necessarily as necessarily as positively as I think all of us here have. So, um, if you could add to your little files electronically or paper, a bill to flag when it comes back over from the House, 1325 will be one of those bills. The sponsors worked, I think, very hard to get this bill into, a, into what I feel is a really good place. I didn't get everything I wanted, right? That's, that's for sure. Um, and I don't know if, uh, if the folks on the other side of the aisle did as well. Um, but with the amendments, assuming they stay, I don't really see a reason to do anything other than support 1325, um, don't know for sure that it's necessary, but I really like, like the, the place that the bill is at today. And again, just want to spend a minute on the mic, making sure that the sponsors know that I appreciate their statesmanship in this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Lundeen to the bill. Thank you very much, Madam President Pro Tem, Madam Chair. Um, so earlier you saw there were an, an array of students, uh, there were probably 40 or 45 students here that were fifth graders. And frequently we all get an opportunity to have students come in and visit with us. So I'm always glad when they are. And we explain a little bit typically of the process to them. Um, and, it, and it is Byzantine. I mean, if you don't watch the process participate in it, you don't understand it. But I explained to them that every bill gets three readings. Um, in each chamber if it's going to succeed, and then if it passes through both chambers and gets rationalized between them, it goes on to the governor for signature. Um, because most people think that this, this second reading, um, as we know it, is the, the legislating. Most people don't understand that the first reading's perfunctory. It's a read, a read across the desk, bills read across the desk, and assigned to committee, 
where the hearings are held, the discussions happen, and, and the first life, the first uh, challenges, quite frankly, the first um, improvements of legislation come in committee. But the second reading debate is incredibly important as well. Because even though we do an enormous amount of the work of our body in committees, and we each develop expertise in our committees and therefore our areas of specialty and expertise, it's important that each of us develop skills across all of the elements of policy that we deal with. If we, in fact, do deign to be, endeavor to be better legislators. Well, healthcare is one of those places where I know I need to become a better legislator because it's a critically important policy matter that is generally driven by government. There's a lot of other things that happen in healthcare that are fundamental, that are incredibly important. You know, you've got your basic interaction between a, a doctor and a patient, between a hospital and a patient, between other caregivers and the patient. But um, there we are, the specialists are over there. I'm, I'm going to vamp for a second here as I'm sure to get their attention because I want to learn from them as I seek to be a better legislator with regard to healthcare policy. Healthcare policy is interesting. Um, it's a triangle as I see it. You've got quality, you've got access, and you've got price. And we're always trying to drive the cost down, cost down, cost down. But when you do that, you have an impact on the other two elements of the triangle. You either as you drive the cost down, get a lower quality, or you get less access, and that's challenging. So that's one of the functional dynamics of healthcare. Another of the functional dynamics of healthcare, people say, well, we, we want to make sure everybody has access to healthcare. But if you tease that out, and you really cross-examine a policymaker typically, when they're saying we want to make sure everybody has access to healthcare, they're probably saying, generally they are saying, we want to make sure everyone has access to health care insurance, which is very, very different than access to health care. Just because you have insurance doesn't mean you can actually get into the doctor. I've got a daughter-in-law who is a native Canadian. She's got a green card now. Um, and she has had the experience of the public health care system in Canada. And she would describe the circumstances, yes, you can always get an appointment. Now, an appointment for your first ob, ob, you know, OBGYN appointment after pregnancy, maybe 10 months later, but um bum the, the, the inherent irony in that is your first, there we go, the first appointment with your OBGYN when you're pregnant at month 10, you've already delivered the child a month ago, probably not. It's not hopefully that extreme, but the point is you can wait a long time. So access. Here's, I've got the bill sponsor's attention now, I think. I thought I had the bill sponsor's attention. The question I have, um, with all of that preamble, far be it for me to actually frame up a gigantic box before I lay down the, the question. The question really is, um, what were the alternative pathways to de delivering or developing an alternative payment model to this bill, which, which is designed by the in Commissioner of Insurance. Are, what are the, the other ways that we could potentially design or promote or, or give greater life to this idea of alternative payment and the alternative payment model, the APM? Because that seems to make sense in so many ways, but my reluctance, my question, and my ultimate no vote is I don't believe that having the commissioner of insurance drive that conversation is the best way to do it. What are the alternative pathways to get at a development of the concept of alternative payment model? Senator Lundin, that was such a great question to ask of the chair. <laughs> is there any further? <laughs> Is there any further discussion on the bill 1325? Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of 1325. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no? no. The ayes have it, and 1325 is passed. Will the clerk please read the title to 1318? House Bill 1318, Representative Benavides, Senator Fields, concerning the extension of the law enforcement, public safety, and criminal justice information sharing grant program deadline. Senator Fields. Madam Chair, I move House Bill 1318 on second reading and urge for an aye vote. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of 1318. All those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Those opposed, no. The ayes have it and 1318 is passed. Will the clerk please read the title to 1349. House Bill 1349, Representatives Duran and Will, Senators Bridges and Priola, concerning improving decision making to enhance post secondary student success and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1349, and there is an amendment coming to your desk. There is an amendment on the desk. Will the clerk please read? Senator Bridges, did you move 13? I moved 13 for I moved okay, 1349 on second reading. Thank you very much. Uh, there is an amendment on the desk, L003. Will the clerk please read L003? Amendment L003. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a permissive amendment, just allowing the department to use, where possible, open source data uh, as they're putting this thing together. Easy amendment. Ask for an I vote. The motion before the body is the adoption of amendment L003. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and L003 is adopted to the bills, to the bill. Senator Priola. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, this uh, bill uses uh, ARPA funds to ensure that when students in the state of Colorado are making a decision on a career path or a place to attend higher ed going forward, they will have uh, better data to make that decision and uh, fulfill uh, their life and their mission in a, in a more streamlined manner. Ask for an I vote. Further discussion on Senate Bill 1349. Oh, uh, there is an amendment on the desk. Will the clerk please read Amendment 4? Amendment L004 by Senator Lundin, Amendment Re Gross Bill, page 6, line 21, after the period at an entity that provides. Senator Lundin. Thanks. Sorry, Lund did you raise your hand? I'm sorry, Senator. I was D Senator Lundin to uh, L004. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I move Amendment L004. Two L004, Senator Lundine. Your voice has changed, Madam Chair. Yes, it has. Please, L004. <laughs> You're lucky it to the amendment, Senator Lundine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm gathering myself here. Um, <clears throat> colleagues, um, years ago, um, the first major piece of legislation I ran as a very young legislator, I ran with a House colleague um, who was a representative from Denver. He's now the Speaker of the House. Um, he and I had shared concerns around the protection of student privacy. The, the reality is um, we increasingly are defined as individuals by the digital footprint that we leave behind because um, everything we do creates now a digital trail. And it is especially so for students. They take all these actions and we gather information on them. We, being school districts, schools, school districts, the state um, department of education, the federal department of education. And that information can be used appropriately obviously, and I believe inappropriately for, um, by both big government and big tech or big business. What this amendment seeks to do is make sure that we are providing clear protection for those students um, as we gather information, and, and this bill has a fairly significant uh, data gathering component to it. So the amendment, if you, if you scroll or flip depending on whether you're a digital, see here I am, I'm the guy who's the data hawk and I'm, I'm scrolling because I want to make sure that, that those who watch my metadata, metadata know that I, Lundin's a quick scroller, he can scroll through the pages real fast. Or I'm a slow scroller, I'm thinking, and, and you could know quite frankly when, when he was scrolling on 1349 he was scrolling fast, must have been comfortable with the bill. But on, on bill 1395 he was scrolling slowly. Well, he must have had concerns with that bill. And you can measure that data and record that data and it becomes part of who I am, part of the definition of how somebody would perceive me. Well, all of those sorts of things and many, 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 many more things become part of what is the record of a student. This particular amendment on page six, scroll or flip, line 21, it says after the period, um, which is talking about the, this was um, we're, we're addressing something that was added in amendment I guess probably in the house I'm looking here yeah added in the house Department of Labor and Employment the Colorado Workforce Development Council and the Department of Education shall provide to the Department of 
department the information that the department deems necessary to implement and or operate the data system. Well, I, I have a concern about that. And so I've offered this amendment that would be an amendment that provides for protection of the students' um, identifiable information. And, and it, the amendment says, you're continuing on there, line 21 of page 6, any entity that provides the department with data or information pursuant to this subsection, 2B3, left print 2, right print, left print B, right print, left print 3, to be clear for everybody, right print, shall, and this is the meat of the amendment, the whole purpose of what I've been speaking about and framing up, shall not provide personally identifiable information to the department. It's critically important that we not gather that as personally identified and then feed it on upstream. Now, I will tell you, as the author of that student data privacy law, lo these many years ago, um, I have had an experience with a constituent recently where they reached down and said, look, part of what you said we would be able to do is have access to the data that is personally identifiable and gathered on behalf of our children, and therefore, um, with that access, have the ability to correct or, or delete, perhaps, or, or make sure that it, it's least accurate, at least accurate. And a year later, one year later, 365 days, 12 months, 11 months, 13 months, a long time, it was a year as expressed to me by the constituent, they still had not been able to get access to that information. So what that tells me is it's critically important that we just don't pass it on from the get-go, from the beginning. And that's what this amendment would do. Now, with apologies to the bill sponsors for not getting into this sooner, we are moving really fast. But still, this is a big issue, and I'm willing to spend the time talking about it. And the, quite frankly, the, the good senator from Teslaville, um, from Adams County, knows that I have a, 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 a personally identifiable information amendment for another one of the bills he's got going. Because this is a, an issue that is critically important to me as a legislator. It's part of the reason that I am in, in the, the body is on behalf of students and in, on behalf of the students, I, I seek to provide protection of their digital footprint. So that is the big framing, that is the request, that is amendment L004, and I would hope the chair would join me in an arousing acknowledgement of the, the yes vote that we'll, uh, we will attain with amendment L004. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You, with all due respect to a senator that I, I like a great deal from Lundinville, uh, I don't know what car you drive. So the, the challenge here, so first of all, big picture, absolutely, 100%, these, all of these institutions are already under rules and restrictions that require them not to release publicly any personal identifying information. The reason that we need this information at the entity level at the state is because at the state level is where we do the match to get the data. We have information from students. There's information from the IRS and from other sources that we use to figure out what the, the return on this investment is one year, five years, 10 years out. If we don't have some of that data at the state level, we can't make that match, we can't produce the data, we can't know which programs are resulting in meaningful improvements to people's lives. That is the entire purpose of this bill, to ensure that our higher education system aligns with what it is that is needed in our communities. Uh, I, I completely, very much appreciate where this amendment is coming from, but do not believe that it actually accomplishes uh, what it is that this bill sets out to accomplish. Would undermine it, I ask for a no vote. Senator Lundeen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And before, before we get to the yes-no vote on the bill, I would, in, in pursuit of the policy objective that I think is a shared policy objective, if there were some way that we could, between now and thirds, figure out a way to get to an anonymizer, we could do something that, that creates, I, I would welcome that. But, but the reality is rolling this up as is, I think, creates a risk to, to PII, personally identifiable information. And, and Senator Bridges. I'm open to ideas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm open to ideas, too. I, again, my concern is that because that match happens at the state level, you have to know who the person is. You've got to have personally identifiable information in it, at the state level in order to match other information. So happy to continue talking between now and thirds. Uh, not sure if we're just full transparency, not sure we're going to be able to get there because of the work that is done at the state level, um, but happy to continue talking about that. Motion is... 
the adoption of L004. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. Do those have it, and L004 is lost. Senator Piola. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1394 and ask for an I vote. 1349. 1349. The motion is the adoption of 1349. Senator Lundeen. Lundeen. So I'm just coming back to put a pin in the prior conversation. I just want to make sure that we find time to actually dig into this. Uh, this is a matter of, I, I think, significance. And so uh, I'm getting commitments. Got commitment. Looking for. Bill, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll work on this off the mic. Thank you. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, committed to uh, making sure we have that discussion with the folks at the agencies that handle this information, that do that matching, and see if there is a way to reduce the amount of PII that is collected. But fair warning, I don't know that there is that way. So we will have that conversation. We'll make sure that the folks, the relevant folks at the agencies are in touch. Uh, I think now, during seconds, would be an excellent time for you to step out of the chamber and, and have those conversations. And I look forward to that happening. That's excellent. Uh, motion is the Ivo. adoption of third Senator Lund motion is the adoption of thirteen forty nine I'll favor say aye. aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it in thirteen forty nine is adopted. The clerk please read the title of thirteen fifty two. House Bill 1352, Representative Mullica, Senator Jaquez Lewis, concerning a stockpile of essential materials that may be utilized in the event of a declared disaster emergency and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Jaquez Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1352. Any discussion? Senator Jaquez Lewis. Seeing none, the motion adoption of 1352. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have in 1352 is adopted. Would the clerk, ple Would the clerk please read the title of 1359? 59. House Bill 1359, Representatives Bacon and Snyder, Re Senator Rodriguez, concerning the creation of the Colorado Household Financial Recovery Pilot Program and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Senator Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1359 in the Finance Report. To the Finance Committee Report, Senator Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In the Finance Committee, we put an amendment on to limit the allocation of the funds to uh, the, Colorado, the CDFIs because they can utilize the money quicker. Motion is the adoption of the Finance Committee report. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have in the Finance Committee reports adopted. To the bill, Senator Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I move for this bill to be passed. Um, this bill is a pilot program, but it's utilized in a lot of other states. This is an opportunity for the Treasury to allocate money to banks and nonprofits to do into community organizations and resources in their neighborhood. Um, it's low impact loans, low interest loans to help people not get under. Uh, taken uh, advantage of with high interest rates and stuff like that. So this is a good bill for local communities and nonprofits that live in their communities to allocate money for them in small amounts. Um, ask for an I vote. Motion is the adoption of 1359. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have in 1359 is adopted. We're clerk, please read the title of 1159. House Bill 1159, Representative Cutter, Senator Priola, concerning waste diversion and in connection therewith, creating the Circular Economy Development Center in the Department of Public Health and Environment, establishing the cost of operating the center as a permissible use of money from the Front Range Waste Diversion Cash Fund and the Recycling Resources Economic Opportunity Fund in extending and removing certain repeal dates associated with existing statutory waste diversion efforts. Senator Priola. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1159. There is no committee report. To the bill, Senator Priola. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, this bill establishes the Colorado Circular Economy Development Center as well as it improves uh, some of the grant making process and the old forward legislation. I ask for an I vote. Motion is the adoption of 1159. Favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and 1159 is adopted. Clerk, please read the title of 1010. House Bill 1010, Representative Sirota and Van Beber, Senators Buckner and Kirkmeyer, concerning an income tax credit for eligible early childhood educators and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator. Senator. What we someone. Oh. Senator Buckner. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 22-1010 on second reading. And the Finance Committee report. And the committee report. To the Finance Committee report, Senator Buckner. Um, in the Finance Committee report, we talked about the financing of this amazing bill. That's what I'm talking about. The motion is the adoption of the Finance Committee report. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The Finance Committee report adopted. To the bill, Senator Buckner. Yes. 
This is a really important bill that creates a refundable income tax credit for eligible early childhood educators. And we need educators and they need, they need and deserve this tax credit. And is there an amendment by chance? You are so amazing. You just yes. Up like this and ask uh -huh. what it is. Yes, there is there is an amendment to this bill, and I will now give this amendment to the clerk. There is an amendment at the desk. Would the clerk please read L? Four. 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 Amendment L zero zero four. Senator Buckner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill changes the dates of Basically, we will have this tax credit for four years before we look at it again, and that's basically what this amendment is doing. And would you please move L004, and Senator I'm going Kirkmeyer. to move L004. That's a proper motion. Senator Kirkmeyer. <clears throat> yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I am recommending or is asking for a no vote on this amendment. A no vote. A no vote. Because. So the amendment changes the number of years for the tax credit from five down to four. And this is an amendment not coming off of this floor, but coming off of the floor below us, who thinks they should get in the middle of our bill after we've gone through a couple of committees and um, only talked to one of the sponsors, which I think is rude. And here's the thing. We went through this whole process of creating this whole new department of the Department of Early Childhood. And we know as we're going through um, creating this new department, at least those of us who are in the Early Childhood Readiness Interim Committee and in the Education Committee, have a really good understanding that there's going to be a shortage, that there is a shortage already, and that there is going to be even a larger shortage of childhood educators. Hence why we're coming forth a tax credit to really try to work to get additional childhood educators. We know, for example, in this state, that 80% of the centers are experiencing a staffing shortage. We know that 78% identify low wages as why recruitment and retention remain a challenge. We know that 50% are serving fewer children. 33% cannot open new classrooms. 25% have reduced operating hours. More than one-third one third of our child care centers, early childhood centers, more than one third are considered leaving the field, and that percentage is higher for minority owned programs. Colorado's recovery from the pandemic and the economic downturn hinges on ensuring parents can return to work. Colorado's ability through Colorado counties to develop the temporary aid to needy families and meet work participation rates relies on the fact that we would have the ability or ensuring parents can return to work or that they can meet their work participation rates. The largest barrier to being able to get to work, childcare. That's been in place since 1997 that I'm aware of. The largest barrier. We know again, 80% of our centers are experiencing a staffing shortage and that more than one third of our early childhood educators are considered leaving the field and the percentage is even higher in minority owned programs. There are 246,000 children in Colorado that are under the age of six, nearly two thirds of all kids who have parents in the workforce and must depend on some form of early childcare and education every day. Hence why we put this forward, the good Senator from Aurora mm -hmm. and myself were willing to jump on this bill out of the early childhood school readiness interim committee because we know there is a huge need and this is one way to start fulfilling that need. And having someone just arbitrarily from the first floor decide that it's a good idea to delete it, to take it down from five years to four years, I just don't think that passes mustard and I don't understand why we would agree to it. So, I'm asking for a no vote on this amendment, Senator L004. Buck Senator Buckner. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I am so delighted to have Senator, the Senator from Weld County co-prime this bill with me because we were both on Early uh, Childhood School Readiness Commission and I was chair of that commission. Um, and I am 
thrilled with the work we did. And yes, the original bill asked for five years before we look at this again, but we negotiated down to four. And to be honest, I'm happy with that four because it could have been one, it could have been two, it could have been three, but we got four years before we have to come back to look at this. And I really think at that time, we will have the Department of Early Childhood in great shape. And I think at that time we can reassess. So I am pleased with the four years because even though it's not five, I believe that because we have predominantly women who are early childhood educators, predominantly women of color and caregivers are some of the vital societal role models that we have and they deserve higher wages. But in the meantime, we need solutions to provide them with this relief. So I am happy with the four years that we were given by the governor's office. Senator Krugmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Given by the governor's office, I just want you all to know we all weren't involved in the negotiation. And I appreciate, greatly appreciate, the good senator from Aurora, my other co-prime on this, working to ensure that we didn't go down to two years, because then what the heck would be the point of the bill? I mean, seriously. So you know what? The governor has a vote. And he gets to have a stroke of the pen. And if he doesn't like five years, then he can take care of that downstairs when he gets ready to not sign this bill, apparently. So they didn't have the respect for both co-prime sponsors to ask both of us to come down and negotiate this because they knew that I would say no. They knew that this was ridiculous. Because here's the thing, and I'm going to go on for a while here, folks. So here's the thing. Why do we need child care educator tax credit in Colorado? Because quality early experiences lay the foundation for a lifetime of success. A child's brain undergoes a remarkable period of growth from birth to three years, producing 700 new neural connections every second. This brain development is influenced by a child's relationships, experiences, and environment. These investments have both immediate and long-term benefits to the individual child and society at large and ensuring that children start school ready to learn preempts a lifetime of remediation at a far, far higher cost. Do I need to remind us, 60% of our kids can't read at a third grade level. That was the argument why we needed the Department of Early Childhood and why we needed universal pre-K and why we need free kindergarten for everybody, free free universal pre-K for everybody as well, everything. And we knew going into this, before we went off and offered all that, before we were making campaign promises come true for the first floor, that we do not have enough early childhood educators, that we have a shortage. It's a huge shortage. 80% of the centers, 80%. It's not like it's only 12%, it's 80% are experiencing a staffing shortage. We know that. We heard about it. In our Early Childhood Readiness Committee, it spoke about there's a billion dollar shortfall for trying to get the number of necessary early childhood educators that we need for these 246,000 children. We are failing. We're failing our schools, we're failing our students at the school level, and we know we have a shortage. We know that this credit works, and yet we're willing to say, no, no, we don't want to do five years because that just doesn't sound good, I guess, for election campaign promises. We're only going to do four years. We're having the governor intercede, superstep, and overstep. This is our decision. This isn't his decision. He doesn't get to negotiate it down. The negotiation should be happening here with state senators on this floor. We know that the early childhood educator tax credit works. We know it works because this program has been basically modeled after what has occurred in Louisiana and Nebraska. They've established a child care educator tax credit. So it's not like we just pulled this out of the air. It's not like we just said, oh, last, last fall, Gosh, what do you think, five years, 10 years, 20 years? No, let's do two. No, how about we go back to five? We didn't do that. So for somebody arbitrarily on the first floor to decide that they think 
they can come in here and negotiate the bill with only one of the co-prime sponsors is not only disrespectful, it's just absolutely wrong. The Louisiana and Nebraska Child Educator Tax Credit that's available to directors and staff providing child care. This refundable credit includes several key components designed to encourage improvements to child care providers' quality, to improve compensation to the early childhood workforce, and to increase access to child care providers among families who use subsidies to pay for child care. Key features of the effective child care educator tax credit includes size of the credit tied to the credential level, which we have. And, and, and before I keep going on, the other thing that just really ticks me off about this is, did I mention that more than one third are considered leaving the field and that the percentage is higher for minority owned programs? And which co-prime sponsor did they go to? The co-prime sponsor me. from Aurora. They put her in a heck of a spot. They put her in a horrible spot. And I'm, I'm very happy. I know she worked hard to negotiate not to go down to two or three or three and got us to four. And I am so appreciative of that. Thank you. I certainly am. But that doesn't dismiss the, um, the issues I have with the first floor on this. Basically not negotiating with both of us and basically thinking they can intercede before the Senate has the opportunity to have that discussion. So, length of service requirement. This is also how it works. Staff would need to be employed for at least six months within the tax year to be able to get the credit. So an effective early childhood educator tax credit. They've got to go through and they've got to get their credentialing. That takes time. It's not like it's going to happen just tomorrow. That's why we made an amendment to the bill that said they just have to work six months in a year to get the credit, that they didn't have to get their credentialing and then go get the credit, because that would have interrupted it. But they have to go through a process to get their credentialing first. That takes time. It can take anywhere from six months to a year at least to start working to get their credit. But an effective early childhood tax credit encourages improvements in the provider's quality improves compensation of the early childhood workforce. We have a shortage. We have a shortfall. We just put in a new department. We just basically made everybody's Christmas wishes on the first floor come through by saying we're going to have free universal pre-K, preschool for everybody. Proposition EE didn't say that. Proposition EE said 10 hours a week. We had to go through and say, you know what we're going to do? free preschool for everybody, three and four years of age. We're messing up human services programs. We're messing up the CCAP program. And on top of it all, we know to be able to do that, we need more early childhood educators. And the way to do that is to get this tax credit in place. And we know these work. So it is absolutely ridiculous. It is outrageous that the first floor thinks that they can intervene in this bill and reduce it from five years to four years when they know that is not going to be enough time for us to get and fulfill this shortage that we need. So I am asking you, I am pleading with you, please say no to this L004, to this amendment, and let's do what's right. Let's work to get enough early childhood educators. You work to pass a bill. You work to pass a bill that says everybody pre, pre, free preschool. And we know we're going to be short. We know we already are short. There is no reason to reduce this down to four years. No reason, absolutely no reason at all. I'm asking for a no vote on L004. Motion is the adoption of L004. Senator Buckner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And obviously, my co prime sponsor is full of fire and vigor, and she has her convictions, and I commend her for that. Well, my commitment is that we are going to get this early childhood educator tax credit. Yes, I was asked to negotiate this. And you know what? I am not going to throw the governor under the bus. Decisions, I am not throwing the governor under the bus. 
because there are decisions that are made in this building that are not my decisions alone. So I appreciate the four years that we are given for this tax credit, one, one year short of what we requested. And you know what? We don't always get what we want with our Christmas list. We don't always get what we want with our Christmas list. And I cannot believe <laughs> that I'm standing here arguing I can't about either. this. Well, I... <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's sing Kumbaya. The motion is to throw the governor under the bus. All those. Senator, Senator Buckner, I'm sorry, Senator Buckner, please. No, I want to finish, and in all seriousness, I understand what my co-prime is doing here. However, I disagree. I am asking for a yes vote for this early childhood educator tax credit as amended, which gives us four years for these amazing educators who need this tax credit. And we can stand here all day and argue about this, but I'm sorry, we are passing this amendment and on second reading, we are passing this bill. The good Senator from Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. Yeah, I actually live in on corporate Weld County, thank you. And I appreciate the good Senator from Aurora. And I appreciate that she doesn't want to throw her governor under the bus but I'm more than willing to throw him under the bus. And wait, hold on just a thing. minute. I certainly when you appreciate that. Um, we're not throwing anybody under the bus today. Okay. That's not what we're here to do. Hold on, you, we, we don't have folks speaking unless they're being recognized by the chair. And so I know Senator Kirkmeyer was speaking. Please, Senator oh. Kirkmeyer, and then we'll have Senator Buckner come back and speak. Excuse me. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just going to remind you all one more time the importance of why we need to at least have five years. Early childhood and education have tremendous spillover benefits for Colorado's economic development. For each new child care job created, more than 1.5 additional jobs are created in the larger Colorado economy. The tax credit needs to go to five years because it's not like tomorrow we're going to be able to start increasing our workforce to the amount that we need for early childhood educators. It's not like within six months it's going to occur or even a year. It's not like we're going to fix that staffing shortage in 80 percent of the senators, centers across the state in the next 24 months. It's not going to happen. It's not like that the percentage of people leaving this field is going to go down. That somehow, miraculously, less than one-third consider leaving the field because of poor wages. This tax credit would give approximately, could give approximately $4,000 to an early childhood educator. That's a big deal. That's a big deal when you're only making 40000 a year. That's big. That's a big reason. That's a reason for early childhood educators to stay in the field. And we need them to stay in the field. There's absolutely no reason why we are decreasing this from five years to four years. No good reason. And we all have the ability here on this floor to have this discussion. This is where the discussion should occur. If there was other discussion that was to occur with the governor's office, it should have occurred at the interim committee. It should have occurred when we introduced this bill. It should have occurred in the education committee when we were putting this bill through. Is that the committee we went to? Did we go to finance? Whatever committee we went to, sorry. That's where it should have occurred. So there could have been full discussion on it with senators. Because this is a Senate bill. 
And I truly do appreciate my co-prime sponsor on this. I know she fought hard, and I would never question that. I know because I watched her in the early childhood school readiness interim committee, and I watched her when we introduced this bill. We both know the extreme importance here. We both are acutely aware of the shortfall, a shortfall that has been happening for years, not just in the last two years, but a shortfall that is going to expand because of what we've approved here by having free preschool for everybody. There will be a huge shortfall. There is a huge shortfall, and it will only grow. 246,000 kids whose parents are in the workforce need to make sure that there isn't a shortage of early childhood educators. We heard the whole big discussion about why we needed to have pre free preschool. Because we all know, we all know, 60% of our kids are not reading at a third grade level. We all heard as part of the discussion of why we needed free preschool. It's because we need to get those kids, and we need to start teaching them how to read even earlier. Because apparently we're not getting it done in our public school traditional education system. So we know the importance of it. So we know the importance of keeping early childhood educators in this workforce. And we know we're losing this fight. We know we're losing the battle. So to just unilaterally reduce it from five years to four years, when we know we're losing the fight, is just not right. It is just not right. And I do think it's disrespectful that it wasn't included in the negotiation. So again, I ask for a no vote on L004. The motion is the adoption of L004. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it, L004 is adopted. Any further discussion on 1010? Seeing none, the motion is the adoption of 1010. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it in 1010 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of 1365? House Bill 1365, Representative Esgar, Senator Henriksen, concerning the creation of the Southern Colorado Institute of Transportation Technology at Colorado State University, Pueblo. Senator Henriksen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1365 on second reading in the Transportation and Energy Committee Report. The Transportation and Energy Committee Report, Senator Henriksen. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. We uh, realize that uh, perhaps the board of directors that were conceived in the original iteration of the bill didn't fully um, encapsulate the industry and the needs that uh, this institution would be serving. Uh, so we fixed that. The motion is the adoption of the Transportation Energy Committee Report. All favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Transportation Energy Committee Report is adopted. To the bill, Senator Henriksen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I ask for, I move uh, House Bill 1365 on second reading and ask for an aye vote. Motion is the adoption of 1365. All those in favor say aye. Aye. I'm sorry. Senator Lundeen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm, I'm sorry I, uh, my presence in the well was not accompanied by my hand in the air. It was on me, not on you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for recognizing me. Um, I just want to be clear, and the question that I had, not having had the opportunity to be in the Transportation Committee, this creates Southern Colorado, Colorado Institute of Transportation Technology at CSU Pueblo, specifies the role and mission of the Institute is to conduct research related to the safety, security, and innovation of railroad, ground, and intermodal transportation and general issues related to surface transportation problems in the state. The Institute must also support government and academic surface transportation related research to serve as a competitive funding source for, source for small Colorado businesses developing and testing surface transportation technologies. The question is this, as an advocate for, for the hometown, in this case the broadest sense of the hometown is southern Colorado, um, why is CSU Pueblo uniquely situated or suited to, to host and, and hold this particular institute? Senator Henderson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you for the question to the good senator from Monument. I, uh, the economic forecast and the labor forecast for Southern Colorado show a need for uh, transportation technology 
positions and a high projected growth in those positions. Uh, we are also sort of uniquely positioned in that we have the TC TTCI uh, train transportation um, testing facility in Pueblo County and we have um, a, a large rail yard that is looking to potentially expand to multimodal capabilities. Um, it is an important part of the economy of Southern Colorado. And I just don't think that this is any different than what we see with regional universities throughout the state. We see a extraordinary aerospace program uh, at UCCS. And what we're looking to do is something very similar. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of 1365. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, aye. no. The ayes have it, 1365 is adopted. Clerk, please read the title of House Bill 1007. House Bill 1007, Representative Valdez D. and Lynch, Senator Simpson and Lee, concerning welfare mitigation assistance for landowners. Senator Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 22-1007. To the bill, Senator Lee. Senator Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. House Bill 221007 was a bill uh, crafted out of the Interim Wildfire Matters Committee uh, meetings and discussion over the course of last interim. It actually was really kind of facilitated out of a bill from the 2019 Interim Wildfire Matters Committee, House Bill 21004, that was uh, a victim of COVID and the pandemic. So it PI'd in um, discussion last year during the interim was to reintroduce the bill. It has a couple of different parts to it. I'm going to speak to the grant portion of the, of the bill. We actually toured um, East Troublesome and Cameron Peak fires and uh, had firsthand experience about what, you know, efforts around hardening of uh, folks' residences could mean and the success of saving those um, facilities when people went through the effort to uh, take some time and, and do some preventative measures. So the first part of the bill, <clears throat> again, establishes a grant in the Colorado Forest Service for uh, outreach and education with folks to get them educated again on the value of what um, the efforts they can do, what it might mean to them down the road in the event that uh, you know they are in the path of uh, the next wildland fire it was kind of ironic, all of these discussions happened prior to the Marshall Fire. It seems a little, um, I don't know, th this is a small scale and in comparison to the outcomes of the Marshall Fire, but it, it's still important in having the grant opportunity to uh, municipalities and government entities to help educate their folks about the value of this program would be very beneficial. C Senator Lee. And part two of the bill provides an incentive tax credit for homeowners to do mitigation around their homes. If they do mitigation around their homes, up to $2,500, 25% of that could be deducted from their uh, taxable income, so $625. So grants to encourage homeowners to learn about it and tax incentives to show them how to do it. Senior for Senator Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Now, and I'm going to try to make the connection between the Wildfire Matters Committee and the Behavioral Health Administration bill that I was speaking to earlier in the day. I'm finished. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of 1007. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it of 1007 is adopted. Madam President Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that we lay over House Bill 1053. Motion is to lay over House Bill 1053. To the end of to the end of the count to the end of the special order second reading bills calendar, and Madam President Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for those following along on page five, so that would mean we would go 1408, 1289, 1290, 1053. Sure. So for those following along, by the end of special orders, we now have added three bills to the end of page five. So it would go 1408. 1289-1290-1053. Thank you. Will the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1217? 
House Bill 1217, Representative Benavides and Bakkenfield, Senator Janal, concerning measures to prevent catalytic converter theft and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Janal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1217 and the Appropriation Committee report. To the Appropriation Committee report, Senator Janal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Appropriation Committee report made an appropriation that was appropriate. I ask for an aye vote. Motion is the adoption of the Appropriation Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those no. The ayes have the Appropriation Committee reports adopted. Senator Janal, to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. House Bill 1217 is another bill to help with the increasing problem of catalytic converter theft. Um, we heard several weeks ago now, Senate Bill 009, that add, to add the materials within a catalytic converter to the process for Commodity Metals Task, uh, Theft Task Force. But what House Bill 1217 does is it makes two major changes to help victims. First, it gives the Colorado State Patrol the ability to create a self-assessment document for businesses who currently conduct activities that are under Commodity Metals Theft Task Force authority. And secondly, House Bill 1217 creates a grant program under the State Patrol and the Auto Theft Prevention Authority to help those who have been victimized by uh, the theft of catalytic converters. These funds will be available for individuals and businesses, for victims, theft prevention, and to help with the identification and tracking of catalytic converters, all to help with the costs associated with the theft. I ask for your aye vote for House Bill 1217. Motion to the adoption of 1217. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. The ayes having 1217 is adopted. <laughs> Clerk, please read the title of House Bill 1251. House Bill 1251, Representative Roberts, Senator Bridges, concerning the creation of the Office of Cardiac Arrest Management in the Department of Public Health and Environment, and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1251 on second reading. Motion is the adoption. Senator Bridges, that's a proper motion. Senator Bridges. Motion is the adoption of 1251. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and 1251 is adopted. Thank you. Would the clerk, would the clerk please read the title of 1269? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to lay over House Bill 1269 to the end of the special order second reading of bills. The motion is to lay over House Bill 1269 to the end of the special order second reading of bills. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and 1269 will be laid over to the end of special order second reading of the bills calendar. Would the clerk please use the title of House Bill 1314? Oh, Madam uh, President Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, ask, uh, I move that we lay over House Bill 1314 until tomorrow, May 5th. The motion is to lay over House Bill 1314 until tomorrow, May 5th. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it in House Bill 1314. We lay over until tomorrow, May 5th. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1364? House Bill 1364, Representatives Cutter and Soper, Senator Story, concerning extension of the Food Pantry Assistance Grant Program and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Senator Story. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1364 um, and urge an I vote. And the Appropriations Committee report? And the Appropriations Committee report, yes, and I have more. To the Appropriations Committee report, Senator Story. Um, the, in the Appropriations Committee, we um, cut the funding dramatically, um, even though we feel like we have lots of extra dollars around. Apparently, we don't have as much as we'd like. So. There we go. So, um, yes, that's what we did. We motion. adopted the appropriation. The motion is the adoption of the appropriation report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the appropriation report is adopted. To the bill, Senator Story. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have an amendment. There is an amendment now at the desk. Would the clerk please read L5? Amendment L05. Senator Story. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, L005 is a pretty short and quick amendment because the um, procurement code prohibits repayment to producers for the agricultural products that are identified in this bill. So we need to strike that um, section. Thank you. Please move L005. I move L005. That's to, a proper. Yes. That's a proper motion. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none. The motion is the adoption of L005. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. L005 is adopted. To the bill, Senator Story. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would urge everyone to support the Food Pantry Grant Assistant Program because it's so important to ensure that we help people that are feeling very food insecure, of which we have many. I urge and I vote on this bill. Motion is the adoption of 1364. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have 1364 is adopted. Would a clerk please read the title of House Bill, uh, House, House Bill 1375. House Bill 1375, Representative Michelson Janay and Senator Buckner concerning measures to improve outcomes for those placed in out-of-home placement facilities and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Senator Buckner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House, uh, House Bill 22-1375, second reading. Uh, second reading. And final passage and ask for an I vote. final passage. The motion is the adoption of 1375. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it in 1375 is adopted. Will the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1394. House Bill 1394, Representative Esgar and Roberts, Senators Winter and Donovan concerning funding for just transition programs to assist communities with economic transitions and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Donovan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that we lay over 1394 until uh, uh, Friday the 6th. The motion is to lay over House Bill 1394 to Friday the 6th. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it in 1394 will be laid over. Correction. One day under the rules. Special orders. Special orders. Madam President Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I withdraw my motion. The med motion is withdrawn, and Madam President Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, under the direction of the Secretary, I ask that we lay Bill 1394 over one day until Thursday the 5th. The motion is laid over 1394 one day till Thursday the 5th. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it in 1394 will be laid over to one, for one day uh, tomorrow, May 5th. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1402? House Bill 1402, Representative Garnett, Senator Hansen, concerning measures to promote responsible gaming and a connection therewith, creating the Responsible Gaming Grant Program, establishing funding mechanisms to support the grant program and making an appropriation. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1402 on second reading. A proper motion, and there's an amendment at the desk. Would the clerk please read L002? Amendment L002. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I move L002. Proper motion to the amendment. Senator Hansen. Thank you. Uh, members, this is a uh, uh, a very small change, which I, I do in honor of my JBC colleague from Carbondale. Uh, we are moving from continuously to annually appropriated. Yes. Mm. So uh, I think this is a great change to this bill and caught it this morning as we were looking at it in appropriations and uh, have made this amendment to answer that request. So I urge the adoption of L002. And let everybody in the House say amen. Senator Rankin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask for a yes vote on this wonderful amendment. The motion on this wonderful amendment is the adoption of L002. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have an L002 is adopted. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Just uh, a very brief comment because there's something very new here, which is that we are now finally, for the first time, going to be properly funding uh, the resources for uh, folks that are struggling with problem gambling. The state of Colorado has historically done nothing but a hotline. It's about $100,000 a year for a hotline, which I, I'm sure was better than nothing, but not much. Now we will have uh, a proper amount of resources to help folks in this situation. Uh, we all are very aware of uh, the rapid increase in sports gambling in this state in particular uh, after the ballot initiative, and I think it's very appropriate that we step up uh, and provide the resources for uh, gambling addiction and problem gambling. So I urge your support, 1402 as amended. The motion is the adoption of 1402. All those in favor say aye. Sin, uh, those opposed say no. The ayes have it and 1402 is adopted. Clerk, please read the title of 1408. House Bill 1408, Representative Herod and Escar, Senators Heisey and Moreno, concerning modifications to the Colorado Performance Based Incentive for Film Production in Colorado, and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. This is Majority Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1408 on second reading. Seeing no further discussion, Senator Heisey. The motion is the adoption of 1408. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it in 1408 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of 1289. 
House Bill 1289, Representatives Gonzalez Gutierrez and McCluskey and Senator Moreno concerning improving access to health benefits for economically insecure Colorado families by enhancing public health programs and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1289, the Health and Human Services Committee Report and the Appropriations Committee Report. To the Health and Human Services Committee Report, Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. In the Health and Human Services uh, Committee, we adopted an amendment that will eliminate the CHIP Plus enrollment fee for all um, participants in the CHIP program. I encourage an I vote. Motion is the adoption of the Health and Human Services Committee Report. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. The Health and Human Services Committee Report is adopted. To the Appropriations Committee Report, Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. In the Appropriations Committee, uh, we simply did a small fiscal adjustment um, that reflects the amendment that we adopted in Health and Human Services. Motion is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee Report. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. The Appropriations Committee Report is adopted. To the bill, Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, colleagues, House Bill 1289 represents another step towards making sure that everyone in our state has um, health coverage. I encourage your aye vote. Motion is the adoption of 1289. All in favor say aye. Polls no. The ayes have it. 1289 is adopted. The clerk, please read the title of 1290. House Bill 1290, Representative Citone and Ortiz, Senator Zenzinger and Quorum, concerning changes to Medicaid to allow for expedited repairs to complex rehabilitation technology and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1290 and ask for an I vote. Senator Quorum, anybody? The motion is the adoption of 1290. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. 1290 is adopted. The clerk proceed the title of House Bill 1053. House Bill 1053, Representative Valdez Dian, Van Beber, Senator Hansen, concerning the use of blockchain technology in commerce and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Hansen. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move for the, the adoption of House Bill 1053 on second reading. The motion is the adoption of 1053. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and 1053 is adopted. The clerk proceed the title of 1269. House Bill 1269, Representative Lantine, Senator Hansen, concerning requirements imposed on persons not authorized to transact insurance in the state, insurance business in the state who are offering coverage of health care costs for Colorado residents and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move for the adoption of House Bill 1269 on second reading. Motion is the adoption of 1269. Senator Woodward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have a few things, a few concerns about this bill. We had, I had a chance to hear this bill in committee. And, you know, one, one of the things that we need to understand, first of all, is, is sort of big picture. How, how big of deal is this uh, healthcare sharing ministry, as they, like, as they call themselves, and program? Um, currently, there are about 50 to 60,000 people in the state of Colorado who participate uh, in uh, these healthcare sharing organizations. There are about 10 or 12 organizations in total. Um, I'm, I'm aware in, in her testimony about one bad actor um, who, who wronged some, some folks and that actor has, is no longer in, around and, and the other folks have not had complaints about them. Uh, currently, the Department of Insurance and the AG worked closely to shut down that bad actor. So this bill seeks to go even further than that. Already, the Department of Insurance and the AG have plenty of power that if they see uh, one of these uh, health care sharing ministries go beyond the scope of what they're supposed to do, make promises to uh, members that, that they can't keep or otherwise, uh, you know, do things that they shouldn't do, already we're seeing that they have the authority and the power that they need to shut those things down. What this bill does is go, takes it a, st a step further and really begins to crack down on, on the honest folks um, by by requiring lots of things, including uh, reporting of, of thing, things and information that they don't already have. So if, as you look behind the scenes, what, what's really happening big picture is that this is a chance that the Department of Insurance, the Division of Insurance, uh, the Insurance Commissioner is looking for a way into this, this thing that's not insurance. Uh, we had uh, several companies show up before us. We had some members show up before us, and it's it's nothing like insurance. However, it's a way that they that uh, members can share the cost. Now, for those of us who are fortunate enough to be employed in this building, 
you know, health insurance is a nice benefit that we get from our employer. Um, the employer carries and pays for most of that benefit, and the rest of us have a small, a small bit to pay. But when you look outside of these walls, there's a lot of folks in the state of Colorado who for one reason or another don't have insurance, can't afford insurance, or, or simply find, or simply ad object to the insurance plans that are out there. Um, you will find as you look at, among these insurance plans for these 50 or 60,000 people across the state uh, that belong to these, you know, many of them are religious uh, folks who, who hold dearly to religious beliefs, and there's certain aspects to the, the insurance that's offered through the state or otherwise that they object to. So this plan gives them an out that uh, helps them get through some of the toughest, toughest things that they face uh, when they face insurance expenses. One of the worst parts about this bill is how heavy-handed uh, the Division of Insurance is really trying to be with some of these ministries. Not only are they trying to collect the data from them, but they're also trying to implement fees and costs that will literally put many of them out of business. Um, the number from, from memory, I, I think it's somewhere around $5,000 per day. Um, and I think that that cost can go on until uh, they get somewhere around $150,000 in total uh, fees and fines before they can simply shut those companies down. So these groups of voluntary member organizations of people coming together are about to face the heavy hand of government who's going to uh, perhaps um, at least put them at risk, but at worst is going to begin shutting them down. So we had a conversation around a few fixes that would, would make this bill a lot more um, amenable to the public and, and people who are in this business and, and people who um, use this tool to make sure that their family can, can get the medical care that they need and not face those long-term uh, risks uh, from, from bankruptcy or, you know, a serious, a serious health hazard. So we're going to have a discussion over several of, of, of the items that we talked about in committee um, and so that we make sure that the, 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 the full chamber has a chance to offer their opinion on those. So what the, the health chair ministries, healthcare sharing ministries said was one of their biggest concerns was that this bill begins to push them into what looks like insurance. Um, it's important to them and to the people of Colorado and the people they represent that, that these entities not be considered insurance. Uh, we've heard from, heard concerns from that community that this bill subjects them to the risk of falling under the same rules that the insurance companies fall under. Uh, the amendment that I'm about to offer will address this concern because it adopts language similar to those in 31 other states that specifically says that these are not insurance. Um, I'm, I'm completely open to the portions of this bill that look at the transparency issue. We need to make sure the people of Colorado, before they sign up for one of these uh, ministry healthcare sharing ideas, is, is make sure they understand it's, it's not the same thing as insurance. Um, and one of the other points, I'm, I'm introducing this amendment before you actually see it. The last part of the amendment makes sure that um, we're not taking away power from the Division of Insurance to investigate any, any entity that is pretending to be insurance. So if they're in, engaged in the unauthorized practice of insurance, the Division of Insurance can simply come in and, and, and do what it currently does. There's a member of the desk for the clerk, please read L. 51. Amendment L051. Senator, Senator Woodward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L051. To the amendment, Senator Woodward. L051, the, the guts of this amendment are, are really in line two, where it says that a health care sharing plan or arrangement shall not be subject to any of the insurance laws of the state of Colorado. There's some additional um, items down below, but you know, ultimately what these health care sharing ministries want to do is make sure that the, the people of Colorado, members who might uh, participate in them, and, and the, governor, the government itself does not consider them to be subject to insurance laws. And I'd ask for an aye vote. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And it, it looks like we'll have uh, 
a, a, a little bit of a, a redo of the committee discussion, which is perfectly fine here on seconds. Uh, I would urge a no vote on L51. I just want to make clear that uh, the Department of Insurance here is in data collection and transparency mode. There is zero new regulation in this bill. Absolutely no new regulation. We're just having the Department of Insurance collect this information because it's very similar to the information they collect on other entities. And so we think we can get uh, efficiency out of that and no need to recreate new systems, saving the taxpayers money uh, as we pursue this goal of better transparency and, and data collection. I thought it was interesting in the opening remarks uh, from uh, the good Senator from Loveland that we are not sure how many people are in these plans. We don't know how many operators there are in the state. Uh, that is uh, precisely what we're trying to solve with House Bill 1269 is to make sure we have a good understanding of the size and scope of these types of operations. Some of them are ministries, some of them are not. They are totally secular. There's a wide variation in the types of uh, entities that, that offer this, this type of service or this type of plan. Uh, call, it, call it what you like. Uh, but I want to make clear that it's uh, a bill that really focused on, on data and transparency and there's no new regulation no new requirements uh, on the regulatory side, uh, and the Department of Insurance is just in a data mode. And I urge a no vote because this amendment would essentially be a safe harbor clause for all of these operators before we even know how many that there are. Uh, and the whole point of this exercise is to get a better understanding of this market. So I urge a no vote on L51. The motion is Senator Wilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I don't have the exact number with me today, but I just to make sure that um, everyone heard, there's 50 to 60,000 people. Uh, there is an exact number in there. I just don't have it with me today. And we also know that there's 10 to 12 companies. So we, we, we know. I don't have the exact number today uh, with me, but we do have an idea what the exact number is. Um, the, the second piece of that is the bill clearly has a rulemaking authority that we're giving the ins uh, commissioner of insurance. So there will be substantial uh, opportunity for the division of insurance to step in and really crack down on these companies and cast its own rules and rulemaking and uh, begin to further limit uh, what they can do. As far as the reporting being similar to what we do with un other entities, uh, there is far more collection of data going on with, with these companies than there are almost any other company that I'm aware of. Uh, if you look out in the public, you know, the, pick the company that you want and, and there's a list of items on really starting on page five of this bill uh, that we don't ask uh, hardly any other company to provide in the state of Colorado. We're, we're really focusing in on, on these uh, providers in, in asking them to go a step above, as a matter of fact, several steps above what we ask other uh, organizations to go through. Seeing a further discussion, the motion is the adoption of L51. All those in favor say aye. Pose no. The no's have it, L51 is lost. Senator Wilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the other problem that I mentioned was as, as this begins to look more and more um, like there's an effort to uh, turn this into insurance, uh, this bill puts all of a, much, a good part of the enforcement under the Division of Insurance and the Commissioner of Insurance. Um, I believe that today, uh, between the Division of Insurance and the Attorney General, um, they have plenty of power with which to enforce the rules as they see fit. There is an amendment to the desk. Would the clerk please read L52? Amendment L052. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L052. Uh, to the amendment, Senator Wilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, this moves the, the power away from the, the commissioner to, and the division of insurance over to the attorney general's office. Uh, we've heard that these healthcare sharing ministries are better regulated by the AG's office because the AG is in a position that he can balance consumer protection and religious liberty. That's not something that the division of insurance currently has to take a look at um, or try to discern. So we believe that it's appropriate to make sure that that power stays within the AG's office and not s switched over to the Division of Insurance. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And this uh, is an amendment we also discussed in committee. I urge the rejection of L52. 
Uh, again, there is no new regulation happening at the Department of Insurance. Yes, they have rulemaking authority, but that's just to make sure they can set the rules so they can get the data that's requested in the bill. Uh, so I really think this is unnecessary. The AG is the consumer protection uh, arm for the state of Colorado. That remains the case. If there's a problem a consumer is having, they can go to the attorney general, just like is the case now. Uh, the only thing happening at the DOI is just collection of data. So I urge the rejection of L-52. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, um, I too um, heard this bill, and um, uh, I want to remind everybody that uh, these health sharing arrangements, uh, it's emphatic, it was testified, you can go to their websites. Uh, clearly, they state on their websites that this is not insurance. Uh, it was testified to that again and again and again and on their websites. And uh, I speak with, uh, with some experience because I have been a member of a health sharing uh, entity like we're talking about. And I knew when I enrolled and I signed up that it was not insurance. So uh, since we know it's not insurance, the companies know it's not insurance, the participants know that it's not insurance. It's on their website informing everybody that it is not insurance. It is not insurance. It is not insurance. It is not insurance. There is no need that this needs to be governed under the Department of Insurance. Uh, that's, uh, if, if there is a problem, uh, then it needs to go to the Department of Law and the AG can take care of it. So this is a good amendment. Uh, please vote yes on this amendment. Motion is the adoption of L-52. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. no. Those have it, L-52 is lost. Senator Wilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one, of the other, one of the other pieces um, that, I, that I think that we've heard some conversation around is that, that this bill does not create new, um, new regulation. And, and, it's, and it's clear, and by word, I, I, I believe that it's, it's, it's clearly more than simply uh, division of insurance, um, simply gathering data and gathering information. Uh, but, but with the rulemaking, they can, they can go far beyond simply the collection of data and begin to tell these entities how to behave, uh, what sort of fees, what sort of reserves they need to have on hand. Um, as, it, as, as we look to hand over the power uh, from the legislature into the hands of someone like the Commissioner of Insurance, we need, to, we need to be careful. I think that some of those decisions need to remain with the legislative body. Uh, so I'm going to ask that we consider eliminating any authority that the Division of Insurance has to enact new rules on these entities. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Amendment L-53? Amendment L-053. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L-053. To the amendment, Senator Woodward. The amendment is uh, pretty straightforward. It simply uh, limits the DOI to simply re um, collecting data and, and prohibits him from enacting new rules. Senator Hanson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, I would urge uh, a no vote on L-53. Um, we've got a clear set of data that we're asking for. You can see that in the bill. Uh, and we think it makes a lot of sense for the Department of Insurance to be able to set the rules for how they collect that and not have us uh, spend many extra pages in the statute books on the rules and procedures for gathering the data that we're asking for. Uh, and so I think that makes a, a lot of sense uh, procedurally. It's what we do in many other parts of state government. Uh, and so please vote no on L-53. Motion is the adoption of L-53. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The no's have it, L-53 is lost. Senator Wilbert, there's a member of the desk. Would the clerk please read L-54? L-054, Senator, Senator Woodward. Woodward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, L-054 adds a clear protection uh, for religious freedom. Uh, one of the things that we heard uh, over and over again was uh, that there was concern by members that as we insert government into a uh, agreement between individuals and those that they uh, choose to participate equally and, and share the costs of one another, uh, that they're treading on some religious freedom aspects. So just to be sure that we don't um, create a position that uh, could pit 
um, the people against the state, we wanted to add some language that, that I think is innocuous uh, by just clearly making sure that uh, nothing within this bill shall infringe upon the religious freedom of, of members. Just to make sure, Senator Weber, would you mind uh, moving L54 one more time, please? Yes, I move L054. That's a proper motion. Senator Hanson. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, I urge a no vote on L54, and I have super great news to share with the body. Uh, I'm going to be reading from a document you may be familiar with. Uh, the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Super important part of our Constitution. I couldn't agree more. Uh, there is nothing in House Bill 1269 which abridges this freedom. That would be unconstitutional. Please reject Amendment L54. Senator Wilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I believe a, a careful reading of, that, uh, of what we just heard, the First Amendment, uh, deals with Congress. Uh, we are not Congress. We are a state legislative body. And so what First Amendments, uh, the right of the state to interfere, uh, certainly has been something that we have stepped on in the past. Uh, as a matter of fact, I believe this body um, week after week passes legislation that is questionable and, and perhaps infringes upon the rights of people to practice uh, their religious freedom. So just because it's written in the Constitution of the United States does not mean that we have as a body uh, in the past done some things that I think are, uh, are wrong and, and stepped on these rights and the protection of religious freedom. So uh, I'm glad that, that we agree that we should not step on those. I believe L054 simply clarifies that uh, this bill, nothing within this bill is going to step into and uh, overstep the freedom of religion. Motion is the adoption of L54. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. The no's have it. L54 is lost. Senator Wilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, I have one final amendment at the moment. Um, and this is one that we also had a chance to talk about in committee. There is a substantial um, financial impact to any inadvertent um, violations uh, those fines and the ability to uh, enact a cease and desist order are pretty serious for some of these small companies. Uh, some of them are not very large. So a $5,000 a day fine and ultimately a cease and desist order could not, may not only put those companies out of business, but in fact it could leave hundreds if not thousands of folks without uh, this cost sharing mechanism that they rely upon to make sure that their uh, medical bills are paid. There's a member of the desk. Would the clerk please read L55? Amendment L055. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L055. That's a proper motion to the amendment, Senator Wilbert. L055 reduces the fines. So instead of a fine of $5,000, it drops that to $500. Still pretty serious. Uh, and number two strikes the language around cease and desist. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And a uh, quick bit of crack legal research by uh, our resident lawyer on the Democratic side. Uh, if folks would like to take a look at Article 2, uh, Section 4 of the Colorado Constitution, we also have a religious freedom uh, section in our Constitution just to remove any doubt. Uh, on L55, uh, members, I would ask for a no vote. We carefully considered uh, what would be the, the right uh, level of enforcement Keep in mind the, the bill has a 30-day grace period, so nothing happens if you uh, step up and, and comply with the law. Uh, after that, the Department uh, of Insurance may levy a fine uh, of up to uh, $5,000. Uh, keep in mind this is half of what we do for health insurance companies, so this is significantly lower than what we do in other parts of the healthcare industry. And so I think this is really appropriate. Uh, these are entities that are moving hundreds of millions of dollars a year around. Uh, I think this is a, an appropriate set of penalties. And keep in mind, there's no penalty uh, with the grace period. And this is just a way for the department to make sure they get the data uh, that is needed to implement the bill. Senator Wilbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, and I agree that um, our state constitution also has some of those religious protection clauses. 
However, instead of passing a bill that could be constitution, violate the Constitution, my amendment a couple of minutes ago was an effort to make sure that this bill does not step on those rights. Uh, I believe that there, this bill could seriously have some long-term impacts, and I, I believe it oversteps. I believe that this bill could one day find its way to court be, as it begins to violate uh, the religious freedom clauses of our own state constitution. So uh, that's why I made those points. As far as you know, comparing the rates that we charge these companies to insurance companies, again, we're, we're, we're hearing the juxtaposition of medical cost-sharing companies with insurance companies, and that's the danger we're coming in. We shouldn't be comparing the two. They're different, completely different, and if you look at the way that bills are paid and, and hear how the process works, they're not the same. They are, this is not insurance, so we shouldn't be comparing them to insurance in the first place. Motion is the adoption of L55. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. The no's have it, and L55 is lost. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, like I had said, and uh, members, um, we heard um, 1269 in the, in the Business, Labor, and Technology uh, Committee the other day, and um, there seems to be uh, some um, confusion about clarity and reporting. It's not clear from the current uh, uh, bill language exactly who is and who is not required to report information regarding the medical cost sharing community to the Department of uh, Insurance. The bill requires any person, which is defined very broadly under Colorado law, who is not authorized to transact insurance and that, offer, uh, that offers or intends to offer a plan or arrangement to facilitate payment of or to cover health insurance costs of services for residents of this state regardless of whether the person is domiciled in the state. This could be interpreted to include not only the sharing communities themselves, but any unlicensed, you know, here in Colorado, third-party vendors contracted to perform services of the, uh, on the community's behalf, which could result in the Department of Insurance receiving duplicative um, and or conflicting information from multiple sources for the same sharing community. The bill also does not currently appear to contemplate how the Department of Insurance would notify such third parties that the reporting requirement does or does not apply to them. So with that in mind, uh, I would uh, offer uh, L070. There's a member of the desk with the clerk. Please read L070. L070. Senator Liston. Um, thank you. Uh, 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 you just heard what uh, amendment uh, this clarifies. That is only the sharing communities themselves that are to report the required information about the offering of the plan or the arrangements um, to the Department of Insurance. I would ask for an I vote on this very reasonable L070. I'm sorry, Senator Liston, just, just to be clear, could you please move L070? Uh, once again, I move L070. Thank you very much. Senator Hanson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members, this amendment would essentially render the bill useless. Uh, so you can obviously guess I'd like you to reject L70. The biggest problem in this space is related party transactions. That's when somebody who's on the board or the cousin of a board member or whatever it might be is a contractor to one of these entities and gets some kind of uh, high value contract that we have no transparency on right now, but in the past has led actually to the bankruptcy of some of these entities. So by doing L70, uh, it would really make the bill non-functional. So I ask for a no vote on L70. Motion is Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Cha uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, members, um, that is not the intent of uh, uh, L070. Like I say, we're just trying to get some basic information as to what these health sharing entities are uh, are uh, uh, going to report and trying to report. They're they're more than willing to report information, and it's it's been. Um, it sounds like, uh, from what the good senator from Denver, he's trying to indicate somehow or. Uh, possibly infers that all of these health sharing organizations 
are on the verge of, uh, that they're ripping people off or that they're on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, and, and that's not true at all. Um, the, um, uh, like I say, there's a, a number of them out there. I speak from experience. I was a member of a health sharing organization. It's called MediShare. Um, they are all over the country. They, they operate in, I think, uh, 31 or 32 states. Uh, they're, they're good people. Um, um, I knew exactly uh, what I was getting into. They have like uh, 450,000 members, uh, I believe, and growing. Um, in fact, I didn't even realize this. I'd forgotten that they've grown so much um, that they have a, a service center in my own hometown in Colorado Springs where they employ uh, approximately 200 people. Uh, the vast majority um, of these health sharing organizations are, are, are well funded. They do an excellent job of reporting. And um, um, what L070 is meant to do is just to clarify what they, what they should report and what might not be needed. Uh, so with that in mind, I would ask for an I vote on clarity and reporting for uh, L070. I ask for an I vote. The motion is the Senator Wilbert on L070. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On L070, uh, one of the things that we heard in committee was how low the administrative costs are. So if you look at, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down the path that the uh, sponsors did. And it, insurance companies are faced with, I, we heard in testimony, they try to hit a medical loss ratio of about 80%. That means their admin costs approach 20%. <coughs> I'm get, sorry, I'm getting a little choked up. When we look at these entities, their costs, their admin costs are far lower. They're about 10%. Um, so simply on a percentage basis, we're looking at about half the cost. When you look at the percentage of which they are a part, one of the reasons people choose these medical cost sharing organizations is because it's so much cheaper. Um, and the reason it's so much cheaper is just because the, the families make some commitments to one another with how they'll behave, live, uh, what kind of efforts they're gonna take. And so ultimately, the, these plans are significantly less expensive. So they're, uh, these plans are getting 10% of a much smaller dollar number um, compared to the insurance plans that we were talking about before. So the admin cost is small. Uh, when we look at, you know, I heard the bill sponsor talk about related party expenses and that kind of thing. That, that's not where most of the funds are spent. The, the individuals get to decide what doctor to go to. They're spent, 90% of the money is, is money that families are choosing to spend on their own for medical procedures and that kind of thing. It has nothing to do with the uh, organization. They don't dictate where you have to go and, and, and those kind of things. So lots of those medical cost sharing questions are simply not part of where we're at here. The other big thing that we heard is uh, most of these organizations don't have the data that's required under this bill. So this bill requires them to do th report on all of the expenses that their members pay. So if you, if you ask these organizations what what their members pay, they only know of those that find their way through these organizations. Many times the members will pay for things on their own, um, either because they, they just find it easier to do that way, they might just decide not to submit it. So we're asking them to submit data that they can't even, um, they don't even have access to. Um, asking the, the state of Colorado to have different rules in how these operate is going to drive up admin costs, it's going to drive up the cost to these users, and it's going to be a lot more work for everybody. So we're, we're beginning to take away the rights of people to choose uh, a way to take care of their own medical needs uh, away from the insurance plans that we try to put them under. We're trying to force them to join the state plan or, or company plans or some sort of insurance plan over which our commissioner has complete control. So this bill does a lot of things. It keeps costs low. Um, it, it makes sure that we still have transparency, but it, it, doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't dig into things that we don't need to dig into any further. So I'd ask for an approval of and ask for an I vote on L070. Motion is the adoption of L70. All in favor say aye. Oppose no. The no's have it, L70's lost. Senator Liston. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, another area that uh, we'd kind of like to uh, uh, clarify that wasn't really covered is the, uh, is the clarifying assistance for uh, compliance. As currently drafted, uh, this bill requires a sharing organization, uh, which is not insurance, uh, to submit a list of any third parties other than a producer that are associated with or assist the person in offering or enrolling participants. It's not clear what it means to assist and whether this would include something like a human resources information system platform and what uh, I'm offering L072 to clarify what assistance is. There's an amendment to the desk. Will the clerk please read L072? L072, Senator Liston, amend reading gross bill page. Six. Senator Liston, please move the amendment. I will. Thank you for the reminding that, uh, Mr. Chairman. I move uh, L072. To the amendment. Senator Liston. Uh, once again, what this amendment does, is it's just clarifying what is meant by assisting. Uh, there seems uh, to be uh, some ambiguity in the bill, and uh, this is a very simple amendment. It uh, uh, just relates to, uh, uh, it's just adding uh, about marketing, promoting, or selling. Uh, so I ask for an I vote. Senator Hans. 072. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, I, I would like to request a no vote on L72. Uh, we've carefully crafted this section of the bill to make sure we're uh, getting the information about uh, how these are being promoted, marketed, sold, brokered. Uh, one of the biggest issues in the past with these entities uh, in Colorado and other states, is there are instances where brokers uh, are collecting very high commissions uh, when they're out uh, selling these types of plans. Uh, you may remember from the health insurance side, we have a very clear regulation of health insurance brokers. Uh, here we're not proposing any new regulation, but we do want to know what's going on. And if we adopt L72, we wouldn't be able to get that information, so please vote no. No further discussion. The motion is adoption of Amendment 72. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. The no's having 72 is lost. There's a member of the desk. Would the clerk please read L71? Amendment L0. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I move L071. To the amendment. Senator Liston. Very good. Um, uh, what L71 done, uh, does, members, it uh, uh, goes after some clarity for marketing materials. You know, there again, as I speak uh, as a participant in a health sharing organization, you know, it's one thing to um, uh, hear about it either from a broker or on television or wherever you may hear about it. But uh, uh, as currently drafted, uh, this bill requires a sharing organization to submit copies of any consumer facing and marketing materials which are used in Colorado. Uh, in promoting the person's uh, plan or arrangement, including plan or arrangement and benefit description and other materials that explain the plan or arrangement. Um, quote, sharing organizations go to great lengths to provide affiliates with uh, collateral for use in marketing. This blanket catch-all provision in the bill could be interpreted to include marketing materials created by other entities that a sharing organization did not know about or authorize. This amendment clarifies that the <clears throat> reporting requirement applies only to materials used or approved by the sharing organization. So the uh, sharing organization, uh, they should be in charge since they're uh, marketing to the individual, uh, they should be in charge because they know uh, what they want to communicate to the, uh, to the person. Um, so uh, all this does is it, instert, it inserts in the bill by person or approved by the person for use in this state by a third party. Uh, this is a very reasonable uh, amendment that just clarifies uh, what they mean by marketing materials um, for these health sharing organizations which I remind you are not insurance companies. So with that, I would ask for an I vote on 071. Senator List, uh, Senator Hanson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, so I appreciate the, the thought that's gone into this amendment. Unfortunately, I need to ask for a no vote on L71. Uh, the section that this refers to on page six 
again, is meant to be comprehensive to make sure we know what marketing materials are being used across the state. Uh, we have seen instances in the past in, in uh, Colorado and other jurisdictions where there's been significant problems because of the marketing materials. Uh, and so we think that that transparency and data is, is very important part of this bill. So I ask for a no vote on 71. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, um, um, I would remind everybody that, uh, to my knowledge, uh, and it was the, this was just the other night, uh, that there were very few, there might have been one that I, I had to step out, but there were few, if any, witnesses that uh, were complaining uh, that they had somehow been pulled by the ear to sign up for these organizations. Uh, uh, I emphasize to my colleagues that uh, the vast majority, if not virtually all, that are here in Colorado, I know there might be an instance in, uh, in another state or two where there's been a, a bad actor, but um, unfortunately it, it appears that this bill is going after the good actors with a sledgehammer rather than just a scalpel. Uh, virtually all of the companies whether they're religiously based or not, they do a good, excellent job. Um, we heard no significant testimony from uh, like a lot of bills where people are lined up uh, 30 or 40 or 100 deep saying how they've been mistreated. Uh, the vast majority, uh, and I, there again I speak about this company called MediShare, there's other good actors, that people are very satisfied that's why these companies are growing, is that they provide an excellent service at a very good uh, price, um, and uh, people are well taken care of. So uh, uh, with that in mind, um, I would ask uh, once again for a uh, I vote on 071. Motion is the adoption of 71. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The no's have it and L71 is lost. The motion is the adoption of House Bill 1269. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Oh. The ayes have it and 1269 is passed. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the committee rise and report. Motion for the committee to rise and report. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the committee will rise and report. Bear. Here he is. Senate will come to order. Will the clerk please excuse Senators Scott and Smallwood? <laughs> Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. The committee has met a number of bills under consideration. Will the clerk please read the report? Mr. President, your committee of the whole begs leave to report. It has had under consideration the following attached bills, being the second reading thereof, and makes the following recommendations thereon. Senate Bill 234 is amended. Senate Bill 237 is amended and passed on second reading in order and gross in place on the calendar for third reading and final passage. House Bill 1354 is amended. House Bill 1399. House Bill 1014 is amended. House Bill 1042 is amended. House Bill 1056. House Bill 1215. House Bill 1220 is amended. House Bill 1235. House Bill 1278 is amended. House Bill 1267 is amended. House Bill 1304 is amended. House Bill 1325 is amended. House Bill 1318, House Bill 1349 as amended, House Bill 1352, House Bill 1359 as amended, House Bill 1159, House Bill 1010 as amended, House Bill 1365 as amended, House Bill 1007, House Bill 1217 as amended, House Bill 1251, House Bill 1364 as amended, House Bill 1375, House Bill 1402 as amended, House Bill 1408, House Bill 1289 as amended, House Bill 1290, House Bill 1053, House Bill 1269 passed on second reading in order advised and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage, House Bills 1314 and House Bills 1394 laid over until 5 5 2020. 
2022 entertaining their place on the calendar. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the adoption of the report. Motion is the adoption of the committee of the whole report. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Cow Amendment 001 to Senate Bill 237? Cow Amendment 001, Senator Fenberg. Party Leader Holbert. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Cow Amendment 1 to 237. The amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, you'll note in the very the first two words of the amendment reference Senator Fenberg. I wouldn't mention his name because I'm not allowed to do that from the well, but that's what it says here on the amendment. And I would clarify, I'm not him, but I am the prime co-sponsor with him on this bill. This is the bill concerning measures to promote increased transparency of funds used in ballot measure campaigns. And this amendment would change the following words. Person who made the expenditure and replace it with the word payee. That would be the opposite. The way the bill right now reads is that the person making the expenditure would disclose, yes, I made the expenditure. And with a change, it would say, I made the expenditure to the payee. And that's the information that we're actually trying to achieve. Uh, this was brought to uh, the president's and I, the, the attention of the president and I after the bill passed the second reading. Um, so that we do not have to ask your permission for a third reading amendment, I would clearly classify this as a technical amendment and ask for your I vote. Unless you want to be on extra committees if you're in the minority. <laughs> Further discussion, Senator Lundin. I was just curious if we had a T chart on that, whether there would be a debit or a credit or a credit or a debit? Yes. Yes. The question before the body is the adoption of amendment L001, or no, sorry, COW1. COW1, is that what it is? Uh, are there any no votes? With a vote of 33 ayes, zero no, zero absent, two excused, Cow Amendment 1 is adopted. There is another amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Cow Amendment 1 to... Uh, House Bill 1010. Cow 001 to House Bill 1010. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Cow Amendment 001 to House Bill 1010. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Um, President. Thank you. It was coming. I was just, <laughs> just taking my time there. Um, this amendment is just to state that the um, floor amendment L004 to House Bill 221010 did not pass. And just to remind you all, this has to do with the Early Childhood Educator Tax Credit. Um, this was the amendment that reduced it from five years to four years. And again, I just would ask for your support on this. This means basically for an educator, childhood professional, the 2,733 educator childhood professional threes who are set to get a $1,500 tax credit for five years would now only be able to get it for four years. And I'm just gonna remind you that it's not gonna start automatically for all of the early childhood professionals 
because it's taking an incredibly long time in the Department of Human Services to get these folks credentialed. So it's another reason why I'm opposed to it going from five years to four years, and I ask for an I vote on the Cow Amendment. Thank you. Further discussion? Senator Buckner. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm asking for a no vote on this cow. You know, all of us want to protect K through 12. I know that the good senator from Brighton wants to protect K through 12. And the strategy has always been employed on other tax credits to be fiscally responsible. We don't know the fiscal landscape in four or five years. In fact, we unfortunately don't have a crystal ball. So we're going to take another look in four years, and I think that's reasonable, and I am asking for a no vote. The question before the body is the adoption of Cow Amendment 1 to House Bill 1010. Are there any no votes? Senators? Bridges, Lee, Buckner, Winter, Gonzalez, Fields, Majority Leader Moreno, Coleman, Jaquez Lewis, Donovan, Henriksen, Kolker, Buckner, Pedersen, Zenzinger, Janal, Story, Rodriguez, Hansen, Danielson, Please have the president. With a vote of 13 ayes, 20 no, zero absent, two excused, that amendment fails. There's another amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Cow Amendment 1 to House Bill 1269? Cow Amendment 1 to, uh, to House Bill 1269. Senator Woodward moved to amend. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Cow 1 to 1269, the Woodward number 1. To the amendment. Um, oh. uh, this amendment uh, deals with the medical cost sharing uh, entities that we just talked about. And specifically, it, it makes sure that we recognize in this bill that we are not going to step on religious liberty. Uh, so this amendment, by voting yes for this amendment, you will agree that to add language to this bill that says nothing in this section shall be construed to uh, essentially step on the religious exercise and the freedom thereof. Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Members, I uh, urge a no vote on this cow amendment. As we discussed, the U.S. Constitution, the Colorado Constitution has this well covered. And keep in mind, uh, many of these entities that we're collecting data on uh, are not religious in any way, shape, or form. So I don't even think this really applies in many cases. Please vote no on this amendment. The question before the body is the adoption of Cow Amendment 1 to House Bill 1269. Uh, are there any no votes? Senators Coleman, Jaquez Lewis, Donovan, Majority Leader Moreno, Hansen, Winter, Bridges, Fields, Gonzalez, Buckner, Lee, Danielson, Pedersen, Zenzinger, Janal, Story, Kolker. Henriksen, Rodriguez, please add the president. With a vote of 13 ayes, 20 noes, zero absent, two excused, that amendment fails. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Cow Amendment 2? Oh, Cow Amendment 002 to. 2 2. Senator Woodward. Senate Bill 234. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Cow 002 to 234. To the amendment. Uh, thanks. Uh, this cow says that we're going to take $73 million from the general fund and put it back into the unemployment insurance tax fund. Uh, that amount happens to match the exact same amount that the auditor had identified as of uh, December that was paid out in fraudulent claims to uh, unemployment during the COVID-19 pandemic and asked for an I vote. Is there any discussion? Senator Donovan. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for a no vote. Question before the body is the adoption of COW 2 to the Committee of the Whole Report. Are there any no votes? Senators Donovan, Jaquez Lewis, Coleman, 
Majority Leader Moreno. Fields. Gonzalez. Buckner. Lee. Bridges. Hansen. Pedersen. Zenzinger. Janal. Story. Winter. Kolker. Henriksen. Rodriguez. Danielson. Please add the president. And Senator Rankin. With a vote of 12 ayes, 21 noes, zero absent, two excused, Cow Amendment 2 fails. There's an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read Cow Amendment 3? Cow Amendment 3 to Senate Bill 234. Senator Woodward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Cow Amendment 3 to Senate Bill 234. To the amendment. Uh, thank you. Cow 03 shows that the following did pass. Uh, amend printed bill page 7, strike line 24, and substitute while lawfully present in the state. Any discussion? Senator Rankin. I ask for a no vote. The question before the body is the adoption of Cow Amendment 3. Are there any no votes? Senators Coleman, Jaquez Lewis, Donovan, Hansen. Majority Leader Moreno, Bridges, Danielson, Fields, Henriksen, Kolker, Gonzalez, Buckner, Lee, Winter, <laughs> Pedersen, Zenzinger, Janal, Story, Rodriguez, Rankin. Please add the president. With a vote of 12 ayes, 21 noes, 0 absent, 2 excused, that amendment fails. Okay. Question before the body is the adoption of the committee, the whole report. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 33 ayes, 0 noes, 0 absent, 2 excused, the committee of the whole report is adopted. Senate Bill 234 is amended. Senate Bill 237 is amended, passed in second reading, and ordered in gross, and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. House Bills 1354 is amended, 1399, 1014 is amended, 1042 is amended, 1056, 1215, 1220 is amended, 1235, 1278 is amended, 1267 is amended, 1304 is amended, 1325 is amended, 1318, 1349 is amended. 1352, 1359 is amended, 1159, 1010 is amended, 1365 as amended, 1007, 1217 is amended, 1251, 1364 as amended, 1375, 1402 is amended, 1408, 1289 is amended, 1290, 1053, 1269 passed. On second reading order revised and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage, House Bill 1314 and House Bill 1394 laid over until May 5th, 2022, and retaining their place in the calendar. The following change in bill sponsorship will occur. Senator Gonzalez will be added as co-prime sponsor on Senate Bill 43 with Senator Cook. Committee reports. May 4th, 2022, Committee on Appropriations. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following House Bill 1326 be amended as follows and as so amended be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. Consideration of House Amendments. Will the clerk please read? The title two, Senate Bill 1. Senate Bill 1, Senators Buckner and Henriksen, Representatives Ricks and Tipper concerning crime provisions through, through safer streets, utilizing design management strategies, and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Senator Henriksen. Thank you, Mr. President. The, um, the other chamber uh, made some amendments to the bill that clarifies what we are always understood the intent of the bill to be anyway and would ask for a concurring aye vote. Move to concur for the aye vote. Is there any discussion? The motion is that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 1. Are there any no votes? 
With a vote of 33 ayes, zero no, zero absent, two excused, the motion is adopted. Senator Henriksen. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for repassage of Senate Bill 001. The motion is the repassage of Senate Bill 1. Are there any no votes? Senators Lundeen, Minority Leader Holbert, Woodward, Simpson, Kirkmeyer. Sonnenberg. Heise. With a vote of 26 ayes, seven noes, zero absent to excuse, Senate Bill 1 is repassed. Co-sponsors. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 2. Senate Bill 2, Senators Janal and Story, Representatives Cutter and Will, concerning increasing the resources available for fire protection services provided by volunteer and seasonal firefighters and a connection there with making an appropriation. Senator Janal. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate concur. We move that the Senate concur with the House amendments to Senate Bill 2. Is there any discussion? The motion is that. It's okay. Discussion? just want to tell you why, but you don't have to. Senator Chenal. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. One amendment was technical, and the other added a million dollars to the mental health support for volunteer firefighters and wildland firefighters. And um, those are the amendments. The motion is that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 2. Are there any no votes? Concurrence, yeah. No votes. We don't want With a vote of 33 ayes, zero no, zero absent, two excuse, the motion is adopted. Do you have that one? Senator Story. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the repassage of Senate Bill 2. Motion is the repassage of Senate Bill 2. Are there any no votes? Senators Lundeen. With a vote of 32 ayes, one no, zero absent, two excused. Senate Bill 2 is repassed. Co-sponsors. Senators Rankin, I've got you. Okay, go so if, if you co-sponsored in the past on, this, on these bills, you don't need to do it again. I know it's real complicated. Changes, all, those rules change like every day. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 8. Senate Bill 8, Senators Zenzinger and Priola, Representatives McLaughlin and McKean concerning post-secondary education support for certain students who have been in out-of-home placement and in connection there with making an appropriation. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 8. Is there any discussion? Yes. The House reduced the navigators. Yes. The motion you is should that vote for it now. Concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 8. Are there any no votes? <laughs> with a vote of 33 ayes, zero no, zero absent, two excused, that motion is adopted. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the readoption of Senate Bill 8. The motion is the repassage of Senate Bill 8. Are there any no votes? Senators Cook. Minority Leader Holbert, Lundeen, Gardner, Liston, Heise, Kirkmeyer, Sonnenberg, Corum, Woodward. With a vote of 23 ayes, 10 noes, 0 absent, 2 excused, Senate Bill 8 is repassed. Co sponsors. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 28. 
Senate Bill 28, Senators Simpson and Sonnenberg, Representatives Roberts and Catlin, concerning the creation of the Groundwater Compact Compliance and Sustainability Fund and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Simpson. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate concur with the House amendments to Senate Bill 028. Any explanation or discussion? Senator Sonnenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. They actually added funding to help the Republican River and the uh, Rio Grande Basin. Uh, excited about uh, potential uh, meeting compact compliance and those groundwater issues there. So as for your I vote. That is terrific, Senator Sonnenberg, because you will need funding to pay your $1 fine for referring to me as the chair. <laughs> Mr. President, I apologize. It must have been a long day, and it's only a dollar. I'm shocked, but thank you. Inflation's impacting all of us. I don't want to. I don't want to gouge you. Uh, the motion is that the Senate concur with uh, House amendments to Senate Bill 28. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 33 ayes, zero no, zero absent, two excused. That motion is adopted. Senator Simpson. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the repassage of Senate Bill 28. The motion is the repassage of Senate Bill 28. Are there any no votes? Okay. With a vote of 33 ayes, zero no, zero absent, two excused, Senate Bill 28 is repassed. Co-sponsors. Mr. President. Senator Sonnenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Since this hasn't had any no votes, I would ask the current roll call be added as co-sponsors. Is there any objection? Was, was there? Yeah. Who? <laughs> there is an objection. So, co-sponsors. Senators Lundin. Liston, Kirkmeyer, I think you guys are all co-sponsors. Heise, Coram, Priola, Rodriguez. Please add the president. Yeah, we got one. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 130. Senate Bill 130, Senators Rankin and Hansen, Representative McCluskey, concerning the authority for state public entities to enter into public-private partnerships for public projects and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Rankin. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 130. Is there any explanation? Great. Is there any discussion? <laughs> no. The motion is that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 130. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 33 ayes, zero noes, zero absent, two excused, the motion is adopted. Senator Rankin. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the repassage of Senate Bill 130. The motion is the repassage of Senate Bill 130. Are there any no votes? Senator Sonnenberg, Woodward, Minority Leader Holbert, Lundin, Kirkmeyer. With a vote of 28 ayes, 5 noes, 0 absent, 2 excused, Senate Bill 130 is repassed. Co-sponsors. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 144. Senate Bill 144, Senator Zenzinger, Representatives Kip and Rich concerning the provision of transportation services by a transportation network company not in connection with a business operated for profit. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move to concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 144. Any explanation? Yes. Uh, the House actually made significant changes to the bill, including adding multiple definitions, multiple safety requirements, and multiple rules, and multiple reporting requirements. Is there any further discussion? The motion is that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 144. Are there any no votes? <laughs> Senator Sonnenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 144. Are there any no votes? Senator Sonnenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. I move
Senators, Minority Leader Holbert. <laughs> With a vote of 32 ayes, one no, zero absent, two excused, that motion is adopted. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the repassage of readoption of Senate Bill 144. The motion is the repassage of Senate Bill 144. Right <laughs> Are there any no votes? With a vote of 33 ayes, now it's unanimous. zero noes, zero absent, two excused, Senate Bill 144 is repassed. Co sponsors. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 162. Senate Bill 162, Senator Zenzinger and Kirkmeyer, Representatives Woodrow and Lynch, concerning the modernization of terminology used in the Colorado Revised Statutes relating to the organization of Colorado State Governmental Agencies without altering the status of the powers assigned to those agencies pursuant to the Administrative Organization Act of 1968. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move to concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 162. Is there any discussion? Yes. Uh, because we added two new de departments, they had to include those changes in the bill. The motion is that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 162. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 33 ayes, zero no, zero absent, to excuse that motion is adopted. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the repassage of Senate Bill 162, the Debbie Haskins Bill. The motion is the repassage of Senate Bill 162. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 33 ayes, zero noes, zero absent, two excused, Senate Bill 162 is repassed. Co-sponsors. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 212. You want to move it? Senate Bill 212, Senators Lee and Cook, Representatives Herod and Soper, concerning the non-substantive revisions of statutes in the Colorado Vice Statutes as amended and in connection therewith, amending or replacing obsolete, imperfect, and inoperative law to preserve the legislative intent, effect, and meaning of the law. Senator Cook. Thank you, Mr. President. We move Senate Bill 212 and concur with the House amendments. <laughs> Is there any discussion? Senator Gardner. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Hi. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to seek assurances from uh, the senator from Well County and the, uh, the, the good, maybe even better senator from El Paso County um, that there are no substantive changes that were added in the House to this bill. Are we sure that the House made no substantive changes, and would they even know the difference? <laughs> the, Senator Lee. Well, we can't answer the second question about whether they would know the difference, but the revisor's bill is a work in progress, so I would suggest that the changes came from the esteemed revisor of statutes who saw that we had passed some bills which had required changes in the revisor's bill, and uh, for example, we created the Behavioral Health Administration that had to go into the revisor's bill. So uh, we can feel confident that the amendments are um, appropriately promoted by the reviser of the statutes and acquiesced in by the House. The motion is that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 212. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 33 ayes, zero noes, zero absent, two excused, that motion passes. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. President. We move for the repassage of Senate Bill 212. The motion is for the repassage of Senate Bill 212. Are there any no votes? Pete. With a vote of 33 ayes, zero noes, zero absent, two excused, Senate Bill 212 is repassed. Co-sponsors. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 21. 
Senate Bill 21, Senators Rodriguez and Lee, Representatives Benavides and Amable, concerning the treatment of persons with behavioral health disorders in the justice system and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Senator Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate reject the House amendments to Senate Bill 21 and a conference committee be appointed. Now we're talking. Is there any discussion? Yes, they took the perfectly good bill that we sent out of this chamber over there and messed it up, and we need to go and fix it. No, the motion is that the Senate not concur with the House amendments to Senate Bill 21 and that a conference committee be appointed. Are there any no votes? There better not be. With a vote of 33 ayes, zero no, zero absent, two excused, that motion is adopted. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 106. Senate Bill 106, Senators Coker and Sonnenberg, Representatives Michelson, Janae, and Rich, concerning addressing conflicts of interest in regional organizations responsible for public behavioral health services and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Coker. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate concur with Sen House amendments to Senate Bill 106. Is there any discussion? No. <laughs> The motion is that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 106. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 33 ayes, 0 no, 0 absent, 2 excused, the motion is adopted. Senator Sonnenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Move for the repassage of Senate Bill 106. The motion is the repassage of Senate Bill 106. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 33 ayes, 0 no, 0 absent, 2 excused, Senate Bill 106 is repassed. Co-sponsors. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 107. Senate Bill 107, Senator Gardner, Representative Snyder, concerning the creation of a Pikes Peak International Hill Climb Special License Plate in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. President. I most reluctantly, and because I asked them to make the change, move that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 107. Is there any discussion? Senator Sonnenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. How in heaven's name can we have over 200 license plate bills and not get it right in the first chamber? <laughs> Senator Gardner. Thank you. Uh, the question from the good senator from Sterling, maybe there'll be a better one next year, I don't know, um, it is appropriate. Um, The reason we didn't get it right was I was asking the Department of Revenue to do something in an expeditious manner and they said they couldn't do it. And so we had to move the effective date of this bill out uh, a little longer. And you know, I, my, my expectations were just too high, um, I would just say to the Senator from Sterling. So that's the reason I'd ask for concurrence. The motion is that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 107, are there any no votes? Senators, Minority Leader Holbert, quorum. Sonnenberg. Woodward. Priola. That's what I'm talking about. Please add the president. Yes. <laughs> With a vote of 27 ayes, six noes, zero absent, to excuse that motion is adopted. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the uh, repassage of Senate Bill 107. The motion is the repassage of Senate Bill 107. Are there any no votes? Senator Sonnenberg, Minority Leader Holbert, Priola, Woodward. <laughs> With a vote of 29 ayes, four noes, zero absent, two excused, Senate Bill 107 is repassed. Co-sponsors. Will the clerk please read the title to Senate Bill 192. 
Senate Bill 192, Senators Zenzinger and Simpson, Representatives Esgar and Catlin, concerning the creation of opportunities for credential attainment and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate concur with changes the House made to Senate Bill 192. Is there any discussion? Yes. They clarified that the program would not apply to an already established apprentice program in which they don't have to accept the credits and that it does not pertain to their existing requirements. The motion is that the Senate concur with House amendments to Senate Bill 192. Are there any no votes? With a vote of 33 ayes, 0 no, 0 absent, 2 excused, the motion is adopted. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the repassage of Senate Bill 192. The motion is the repassage of Senate Bill 192. Are there any no votes? Senators Lundin, Sonnenberg, Minority Leader Holbert, Gardner, Woodward. With a vote of 28 ayes, 5 noes, 0 absent, 2 excused, Senate Bill 192 is repassed. Co sponsors. The following senators are appointed as members of the first conference committee on Senate Bill 21. Senators Rodriguez, Chair, Lee, and Simpson. If you were as strong as those members were in rejecting what the House did, maybe you too could be on a conference committee. Members, today is a special day. It is our very own Senator Jaquez Lewis's birthday. Please join the choir in wishing her a very happy birthday from the well. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. President. The Senate Finance Committee will be meeting at 415 in the old Supreme Court, and we will be taking up a number of bills um, in a different order than what appears on your calendar. <laughs> <laughs> we'll begin with Senate Bill 205. Two, uh, we'll then uh, move to 1246, 1005, 1149, 1205, 1380, 1006, 1051, 1259, which is the one that moved, and 1355. Yep. See y'all then. Uh, we're going to take about a half hour break before we convene in the old Supreme Court. See y'all then. Senator Bridges. Do you have any, like, a, I have a trick for us. Senator Hanson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. For members of Senate Appropriations, our exciting work continues. I'm pleased to let you know you're going to get to sleep in just a little bit more tomorrow because we were not going to start until 8 o'clock. We will have a number of bills under consideration, uh, assuming all of these make it out of their first committee, including Senate Bill 205, Senate Bill 232, 
House bills 1013, 1063, 1077, 1233, 1256, 1287, 1327, 1366, 1378, 1386, 1389, and 1390. See you at 8 o'clock tomorrow, LSBB. Senator Story. Thank you, Mr. President. Capital Development Committee will meet tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Room 357. See you there. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Mr. President. I request a moment of personal privilege. Granted. It's just a tribute. It's not actually the greatest song in the world. The Senate of the Colorado Legislature hereby extends heartiest congratulations and commendation to Western Governors University. 25 years ago, Governor Roy Romer and the Colorado General Assembly, that's us, launched Western Governors University to provide access to affordable education and training opportunities through online competency-based programs, along with other member states of the Western Governors Association, and pledged to offer high-quality career-focused degree programs in fields vital to the state's economy, including business, health professions, teaching, and information technology. Since its launch, WGU in Colorado committed to helping all Coloradans achieve their dreams for a university degree and career success. Today, WGU in Colorado has grown to serve more than 2,700 full-time active students and has awarded more than 6,100 degrees to business leaders, nurses, teachers, and information technology professionals. So I assume that's between 6,100 and 6,200. Very precise number. WGU also employs more than 150 individuals who reside in our great state. The state of Colorado is proud to recognize and congratulate Western Governors University on its 25th anniversary in serving students in the centennial state. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, WGU. Senator Heise. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for a moment of personal privilege. Granted. And for my... Uh, co-tributor to join me down here at the uh, well. The good senator from uh, Fort Collins. Aging Senator Janal. I will begin. The Senate of the Colorado Legislature convened in second regular session of the 73rd General Assembly hereby recognizes Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month. Motorcycles occupy a significant place in Colorado and American history, having made contributions to numerous military campaigns, law enforcement operations, and the culture of the American West. For many reasons, Coloradans chose motorcycles as transportation alternatives. Over 200,000 motorcycles are registered in Colorado and are used on public roads and highways, providing re reliable day-to-day -day transportation and recreational opportunities. Unfortunately, riders and passengers of motorcycles face countless hazardous hazards and unforeseen circumstances on the road. As such, state and national Share the Road campaigns have been created to help to increase motorcyclist safety. The motorcycling community has made an ongoing commitment to increasing awareness of appropriate safety measures and to increase participation in rider training programs offered throughout Colorado to help avoid accidents. The members of the Colorado Gen General Assembly recognized May 2018 as Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month to promote safety for all motorcycle riders through education and training and to encourage all motorists to share the road in Colorado. On the request of Senator Joanne Janal and Senator Dennis Heisey, given this fourth day of May 2022, State Capitol, Denver, Colorado, signed Steve Finberg, President of the Senate. Senator Janal. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as a uh, member of the motorcycle community, I am a motorcycle rider. I rise in support of this tribute. Women riders are increasing in number each year, and there are also about a dozen people in this capital who ride motorcycles as well. Some on this side, some on this side. 
some out there. Um, riding solo is great, but a group ride is even better. I love to put a bag on, on a, a duffel bag on the back of my motorcycle and a tent and take off west. It's a really good feeling to be gone for a few days. I've been to Sturgis, which is quite an eye-opening experience. And uh, I also ride solo for an hour or two to help me collect my thoughts and clear my mind. Uh, that break is so helpful for many decisions I have to make here and elsewhere. But I've met many friends and acquaintances riding my motorcycle. And to any new and future riders, my only request is that you take an abate class for your safety and for the safety of others. If you ride, you understand. And if you ride, you know the feeling of freedom. Thanks for bringing this forward. Senator Heise. Thank you, Mr. President. Look twice, save a life. Further announcements? Majority Leader Moreno. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I moved at the Senate recess until 4.30 p.m. today. Colleagues, you do not need to return. We are just reading bills across the desk. You could. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have in the Senate will recess until 4.30 p.m.